Here's a quote from Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis. No, humans and chimps aren't nearly identical, and that's not surprising because we're not related. Chimps belong to the great ape kind, and humans were created distinct from the animals in the very image of God. Adam from dust and Eve from his side and given dominion over creation, including the great apes. And then he cites Genesis here. That is a whole big basket of things that don't make any sense. First of all, kind isn't a kind of classification. That's not something that we actually use in biology. Also, it's not just that humans are related to great apes. Humans are great apes. That's not a matter of opinion or worldview or ideology. When you classify great apes amongst the other animals, you have no choice but to lump humans in with them because that's where we fit morphologically, behaviorally, and genetically. This is just someone who simply refuses to understand how actual biology works and is trying to make excuses for a book which was written thousands of years before we knew how to classify animals, as is very evident by other descriptions of other animals in the books. But hey, I could talk about this all day. If you think that humans aren't great apes or that we didn't come from monkeys or any of these other things that you hear from people like Ken Ham, call the show because it starts right now. Hello, hello. My name is Forrest Valkai, and welcome to The Atheist Experience. Uh, today is October 22nd, uh, and I'm joined today by the lovely J. Mike. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm good, but I'm a little puzzled. I don't, like, I don't know how there could be still British people if, you know, like... If, like, if yeah, if Americans came from the British, yeah, then how are there still British? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah I'm very it doesn't confused. make any sense. <laughs> this 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 whole American Revolution thing just doesn't stack up. Uh, listen, man, we've, we've got a great show for everybody today. I'm really, really excited to get started. Um, the lines are already filling up, but we still have plenty more you know open spots, especially if you're a theist or if you're a creationist. If you want to call in and talk to some people about these things, here's your chance to do so. Go ahead and give a call. The number's right there on the bottom of the screen. But before we get started, we have a couple of announcements and a couple of things that we have to tell you. The first thing that I have to tell you is that the uh, Atheist, uh, sorry, the Atheist Experience is a product of the Atheist Community of Austin, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion of atheism, critical thinking, secular humanism, and the separation of religion and government. That's number one. Number two is we got to go through the question of the week. We do this awesome new thing now where we'll ask you a question. We'll talk a little bit about it. You can answer the question in the comments and there's a good chance we might just read your comment here on the air last week's uh uh question was let's see here oh a share your experience type thing that's what it was we said wrong answers only uh god said uh, god sends natural disasters because he's mad about blank that was what we asked last week and we got three different answers the first one is uh god causes natural disasters because he's pissed that firefly only had one season you know what that's that's justifiable. That's reasonable. I'm I'm finally on God's side. Um, the second answer we got was God sends natural disasters because you touch yourself at night. Again, truth. We all know what you're doing, Tom. Uh, and then finally, can you? There's one guy watching his name, Tom, who's pooping his pants right now, and maybe he's into that. We don't have <laughs> shame here. Um, and uh, then finally, number one is God sends natural disasters because we, he went on the Maury show and found out that he was not the father, and that is his way to celebrate. Loving that. Uh, this week's question of the week: wrong answer is only what's the real definition of the soul? That's what we're asking this week. So leave your comments down below. Tell us what the real definition or i guess the not real definition of a soul is and maybe one of the hosts will read your comment next week uh j mike do you have a a, a something for that the real definition of the soul uh yeah uh, well i think the concept that's being tracked is i feel ways about stuff and so i'm going to put it in this box over here and call it, label it soul yeah yeah so, exactly that's, exactly that's, that's that's the real definition uh, at least to me i love that I love that. Um, we've got uh, a bunch of callers lined up, and we it's a short show, and I am notorious for running late on this show. So I'm going to try to not do that and instead just jump straight into calls. Is that cool with you? Let's do it. Sick. Okay, so looking through here, I'm going to go first with Ben in Utah, pronouns are he, him, who claims that he has seen miracles happen. Ben, you are on the Atheist Experience. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm really, really good. 
So tell me about these miracles that you've seen and how do you know that they're miracles? Well, let's start off. What is a miracle? Can you tell me what a miracle is? By my definition, it would be something that necessarily defies the the natural order, so to speak. Something that goes against our understanding of physical reality, something that defies the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, the laws of science, whatever, um, in the specific benefit of a person or persons, specifically. Is that something that, uh, you know, a, a supernatural being does through supernatural means that has no possible logical explanation? Not that it doesn't have an explanation, but that it has no possible naturalistic explanation. That's what I would say. But maybe you're using a different definition from me. So what, what would you say that a, a miracle is? I say that pretty much explains it, you know? Cool. Perfect. So what miracles have you seen? And how do you know that they were miracles? Well, uh, I was in church once, and there was this family. They were struggling because the mother and father had a divorce. So the mm -hmm. kids, one of them was my age. He was, his name was... Colton, and he didn't know whether to keep coming to church or not. So in our church, we do this thing called fasting. It's where we pray and we don't eat because right. we want to show that we are devoted to this. So what I did was I fasted and prayed that she would feel comfortable and around like her family and the son will, you know, like start to come back to the church, you know? And the very next week, he started to come back to church and he came more often, he came to the activities. He came to like, you know, just started attending more. And to me, that felt amazing. And I just, just felt good. You know, is that your miracle that you prayed and fasted? And then this person came back to church. Yeah. I don't so, very much. Don't before, so really quickly, just, I, I'm sorry, Jim, I got, I, no, I know you're good. I, I'm, you're probably going to ask the same thing I'm asking, but first I just want to return to the definition that we gave a minute ago. You and I agreed that a miracle is something that cannot be explained by naturalistic means. Something that that is not that we don't have an explanation, it's that we can't have a natural explanation. Explanation. It is something that is, by definition, supernatural in origin. We, we agreed on that, right? Yes, we did. So, can you really not think of any possible way that this person wouldn't just decide to come back to church by any natural means by their own thinking it has to be a supernatural thing for you you you, you can't think of any way that that could just happen by itself yeah um i mean if i were to choose between dirt biking and coming to church i'm pretty sure i'd go dirt biking you know but the fact sure. that he didn't come for come to church for like like a while and then he just all of a sudden came back the moment I prayed about it, it's kind of weird, don't you think? No, no, not at all. I mean, this is not like even a little bit, yeah. I mean, don't you agree? People um, can stray away from their faith, or they can um, maybe they don't care about these types of questions that much, and they went to church, and then they come eventually, kind of go, you know what? Something happens in their life, right? I, I, do you really think that there couldn't be an explanation, like something happened that you didn't have access to, like something in their life, and that got them to start questioning it more? And just all it takes for them to do is, maybe I should go to church. Let me just try this out, right? That doesn't sound very supernatural to me. That sounds like somebody going through a process and then thinking that that's the solution potentially. Like that sounds like way more likely of an explanation than some kind of supernatural explanation. I mean, what do you think? I think that is, I guess that is true. But like, have you, have you ever been to church before? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I tried really uh, hard in high school dating someone who was Christian and I went to church and I tried to be as respectful as I can. I was always the, you know, the guy that was like, uh, he's not a Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, and I tried really, really hard and even gave it an honest shot. So I can say, honestly, I've been to church and I, and I gave, and I honestly gave it, tried to give it a shot. Yeah. There was even a time in my life where I wasn't, I, I wasn't like full as, as atheist, as outspoken as I am today, but I certainly wasn't religious by any means, but I thought that there was something to it and that it might make me a better, more well-rounded person to go and listen to some stuff. And so, yeah, I, I definitely tried to start going to church after not having gone for over a decade. Uh, and that certainly wasn't a miracle either. I just, I looked into it a little bit more 
I decided it might be worth my time. I gave it a try for a few weeks. I found that it wasn't worth my time and I stopped doing it. Like so that's, that's what we're trying to get at here is that this person, maybe they, he went home and his parents told him, hey, you really need to start going to church again. Maybe he had some social pressure from his friends or his community. It's If he's going to church in the first place, very likely he's got a religious family, maybe some religious friends, friends like you, who might have given him some social pressure, meaning to or not, that encouraged him to go and try church out again. Maybe he was feeling down and questioning his beliefs, and that made him pretty sad, and he wanted the feeling that he had before then, and so he went and tried church again. Maybe he saw a YouTube video or some influencer on TikTok that was Christian that said something that, that, that resonated with him, and he tried again. Maybe he was bored and decided he'd do something more interesting today and go to church. There's a million and one reasons why somebody might not go to church for a while and then start going again. And what you're proposing here is that none of those reasons matter or are even really possible. The most likely explanation is divine intervention. Um, and that to me seems like a really, really big leap. Like that's, that's a pretty big logical stretch. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's a, a philosopher named David Hume who famously said like, there's two options here. Either the laws of the universe have been suspended in my favor. Something miraculous and supernatural has happened with me and my community in mind, or I made a mistake. You're the star maybe, player, Forrest. Yeah, may, maybe I just didn't actually know what was going on, and I was just under a misapprehension about it, you know? What's really more likely? Did something happen that you're not aware of in this person's life? Or did the clouds part and a ray of sunshine come down and Jesus Christ told this kid to come back to, you know what I mean? Like what's actually more reasonable yeah. and more likely? Okay. Um, I just want to talk about one more thing real quick. Sure. About uh, like you're atheist. You believe in like math and science, right? Or is that just a stereotype? Gra grass and science? He's in math. Oh. Uh, yeah. So uh, you, I want to be clear. It, it, it is somewhat of a stereotype, but it's not a bad one. Uh, you believe in math and science too, I hope. Otherwise, you would, you know, the phone that you're using to call us right now wouldn't be working without math and science. Uh, the definition of atheism is simply that we don't believe that a God is real, that there's, there's any such thing. Um, there are some atheists who are conspiracy theorists who don't believe in uh, various parts of science. There are some atheists that are Democrats and Republicans and, and, and who are smart and who are dumb and who are... The, the whole definition of atheism is just that we don't believe that there's such a thing as a God. And there's Michael, lots and lots of people fall into that. Michael as for humor is a, an atheist and a, a, like a professor at a, at a college. And he yes. believes that a soul exists, right? Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, exactly. So like it, they, it doesn't, it's not exclusive. It just tells you one yeah. thing. Potentially as as far as Mike and I are concerned, you can probably fit whatever stereotype you like, because we are pretty outspoken the, uh, atheists. Uh, Mike yeah. studies philosophy. I study biology. And so, like, that is the where we're coming from when, when we talk about when we do shows like these. Sorry, I, I know that was probably a bit of a long winded answer for what you were asking. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page about it and you don't you know, think think anything weird of us. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, totally. But. For math, math, like, can did we ever discover math, or was it there before? Like, going back to math, the definition of math is something like a uh, how, like the patterns of numbers and all that. Yeah, yeah. Like, do you think so, it was in our head, or you know, like our? That, that's head? actually that is actually a debate within the mathematics community among amongst math scholars is whether math is invented or discovered. Um, uh, as for me, I'm one of those that says it's discovered. Uh, that you, we can say we invent a new field of math, like we, we invent new ways of doing mathematics. But at the end of the day, the planets speak math. Your circulatory system speaks math. Like the, 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 the world around you, the universe at large, speaks math. And we use mathematics in order to understand the universe. So, for example, you think back to um, you know, uh, Johannes Kepler. There was this uh, guy yeah. named Kepler, and he, you know, plots out the motion of planets. He comes up with Kepler's laws of, of orbital dynamics, of, of how planets orbit. He finds out that or, or the orbit of planets aren't perfect circles like Copernicus thought. They're actually ellipses, and they, they go around these focal yeah. points, and he comes up with all these. But nobody knows how that happens. Nobody knows what that's all about. And so a little while later, somebody brings this 
the, this data to this guy named Newton. And Isaac Newton's like, all right, I'll figure it out. Comes back after a month. He's like, yo, these aren't ov ovals. These are conic sections. They're slices of a cone. And everyone's like, how'd you figure that out? And he's like, oh yeah, I invented integral and differential calculus. He discovered the, the way yeah. that this works by inventing a new system of mathematics. So that's, yeah, the, the universe speaks math. Um, and what we're doing as scientists and mathematicians is just finding out how to speak that language. Where it's like the Rosetta Stone. We're learning how to speak this language that the universe speaks. Yeah. So another thing about math is like it has infinite information. If math has variables and like infinite amount of numbers, then it's like it has technically all the knowledge. You know, like any math has already mm -hmm. every single combination of every numbers, well, which can no. be like decoded I, into every book. Well. You know. I see where you're going with that. I, uh, J. Mike, do you have a particular like? I, I get the vibe of that. Well, I mean, presumably they're going to be like tautological, right? They're going to like it's not going to be like um, it's not going to tell me like you can model things obviously with mathematics, like, but there's going to be some identity in the world, some empirical identity that you have to actually go out and do some work, right? Get get your get your hands dirty. And that's not going to mm. be like a derivation from some mathematical proof, right? You're, um, you have, it has to be applicable in, in yeah. some way. So I, I get the idea of like having an infinite num like possible permutations of numbers could theoretically lead to yeah. like, it's like the, there's that website, the library of Babel, where they're trying to put together every possible combination of, of you know English characters in order to produce oh, yeah. every single possible you know, book or ever written. And like you can go on the Library of Babel, you can look it up online, libraryofbabel.info, I think it is. Um, and um, you can type in freaking anything, any weird thing that nobody would ever possibly. And sure enough, that's been written by this AI that's just cranking out every possible combination. So like in that way, I can see what yeah. you're getting at. But that is a like like J. Mike was alluded to. That's that is a strictly theoretical thing. That's like pi. You know what I mean? It, if you have an infinite stretch yeah. of numbers, theoretically speaking, any combination would be in it. But that doesn't mean that you can learn anything by randomly coordinating numbers your whole life. You know what I mean? I guess. Uh... If somebody could make that that yeah. proof and derive derive those facts in the world, I don't think oh, Boris would be be uh, opposed to that. No, no, I'd be super into it. Yeah. Is it. Something you could just go learn. If I could, if I could do with the Library of Babel right now, you can search anything you want and come up with you know that. If you could type in a question and come up with the answer, that'd be pretty freaking sick. But such a thing does not exist. That'd quite be awesome. Yet. Yeah, I don't think nor, there's gonna nor be may a, it ever. Yeah, we probably won't be able to do the the spiritual or moral, you know, algebra or so yeah. to speak to know, you know, exactly did Jesus say this, you know, on the there's, of the mountain. So, someday, so, yeah. I, I don't I'm not not convinced that we may be able to use mathematics to figure out whether or not you should have another kid or what you should have for lunch that day or you know, where exactly. you should go to university, you know. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Did did you have a particular thing you were driving at there, Ben, or did you were you just talking about math? Yeah. I actually do. Um, I'm going to okay. say one more thing. Uh, it's like, you know, how math kind of like controls everything, I guess. You know how like the the expressions and all that stuff, like, you know, it makes, it shows how elliptical orbits work and all that stuff. So like, you know, math shows how everything works, right? Uh, it depends on if you're a determinist, how far you would take that, that statement. But I, in the spirit of what you're saying, sure. Yeah. And so, so what what does that what does that mean then for us? Well, I just wanted to kind of compare that to God, actually. It was crazy enough. But like you know how math is like kind of discovered, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kinda of like God, it's it's like it's discovered in a mind, you know? Like you have to have a person to discover it. A person to discover, mm -hmm. you know? And then it also like kind of has all the combinations of everything, so it's in a way all knowing, like God. And it controls sure. everything like God. So you're kind of like describing so, God there for a second. So Ben, I just want to be honest with you that I did the exact same parlor trick that you're doing right now. When I was probably about 18 or 19, I was getting into science and I was thinking like, Oh, Hey, this is, you know, kind of like a guy, there's this energy that permeates everything in math that's behind everything. And kind of, if you think about it and squint your eyes a little bit, it kind of sounds like a God. And what like, 
made that fall apart for me was number one, I started applying the exact same rules of logic that I would to literally anything else to that. And it fell apart. Um, and then also is that, you know, if that is, if you want to call that God neat, we have a different word for the same thing. What good is it? it it's not, math is not, you know, granting wishes or answering prayers. Math is not something that we can see in our day-to-day -day life having an influence over us besides the applications that we use it for. Math doesn't get up and do anything. We have to use math to do a thing. And just yeah. because the universe follows certain patterns, math is the way that we describe and explain and understand those patterns. But two is not a real concrete thing. It's just a concept that we use to describe ordered and systems and things. Like it would be weird to say like, you know, it's like a God and the whole concept we're tracking is creating the external world around us. Mm -hmm. And numbers are causally inert, right? They don't cause things. They don't engage in causal right. relations. And so then it couldn't have intentions and beliefs and thoughts. And then so the whole thing so it seems to fall apart pretty quickly because uh, presumably the concept that we're trying to track with God, or at least what the thing that I call myself an atheist that I either think doesn't exist or, you know, don't believe given a new concept, you know, very a new twist, a new flavor, so to speak, being presented Right. is that the, the commonality is going to be that there's this mind that exists alone, it has beliefs, uh, intentions, something like that, and it creates the external world, right? It exists mm -hmm. alone, it creates the external world. That's like the general concept I think most people are tracking, and none of that fits in relations to mathematics because they just don't engage in causal relations. Right. That's 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 really the biggest thing is like, yeah, you can apply all of these wonderful properties to mathematics, but like mathematics is not an intelligent thinking being that intentionally does things what use would this be to call this god you know what i mean exactly yeah <clears throat> so maybe anyway ben we've got god we've, itself. oh yeah yeah of course you you'd have to yeah we've got a few other calls in line but i would just i would challenge you to just you know think about if this god is real what is it doing is it useful to us? Is it doing a good job at running the universe around us? If you want to say math is the way that it does things, okay, sure. There's, you know, apologists have said crazier stuff. That's fine. But like, really, I would just challenge you to ask, you know, what do you actually believe in and why do you actually believe in it? And do you have a good reason for believing that something that, like I said, the same, the same logical and moral principles that you would apply to anything else or do you make special exceptions and special rules and special distinctions for this God that you wouldn't apply anywhere else? And just, it's easier to believe it that way. That's what I would challenge you to do. And if, if you want, call back in again next time, J. Mike or I are on, and we'll talk about it some more. Cool. Yeah. Don't call yeah, the other hosts. So much. Just call yeah, us. Only. Exactly. <laughs> only call us. We're the best hosts, except for Christy <laughs> Powell and also all the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> for, we got forced to commit yeah. a contradiction. Oh my gosh. That's right. amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Have an awesome day, dude. Yeah, you too, bro. All right. So uh, if you watching this uh, would like to support us and what we do, you can do so in a variety of ways. Uh, first of all, we have brand new and exciting merch here at the ACA. Uh, you can buy a, a custom engraved, uh, or you can buy all these, these beautiful hoodies and phone cases and mugs and things like that. And we even have a special, I believe that's monthly merch going on right there. You can tell that I'm struggling because I read the wrong prompt. <laughs> um, so buy that merch. It's it's a crazy cool thing to do. Uh, and you can also donate in other ways. If you want to give us money and not receive a t-shirt, that is an option. You can click the join button down below and that really helps us out. That's way you can get, uh, if you're a channel member, you get all sorts of cool emojis, including some emojis with some of our hideous faces on it. Look at that. Um, you can even uh, join our Patreon. If you'd like, there's a way that you can do that as well. Patreon support is, is massively helpful for all sorts of creators. And, and we're just one of those. So like definitely check out different ways you can support the ACA. And I'll tell you what I was supposed to tell you after this next call. We'll get there. It's a stinger for you. It's a little, little, little cliffhanger. You'll get to know what I was supposed to read when we're done with this person. Uh, are you ready to jump into the next call? Do it. Okay, we've got Levi, pronouns he, him, calling in from Canada. Uh, why do atheists have morality if they believe that we are just animals? Levi, you're on the XB. How are you doing? Not bad about yourself. I'm really, really good, dude. That's so good. Tell, good. Us, tell us more about that. That's what I've got on the call screen, but I'm assuming that you have more to it than just that question. Well, yeah, no. So one of the things that, like... 
okay, so I'm a Christian. I believe like that my moral morals come from God, right? It's in the Bible mm-hmm. where my morality comes from. One of the things that I struggle with with atheism is that if you believe as an end to atheism, if you believe in atheism and that we are no different than animals, mm-hmm. then doesn't that undo any kind of concept for morality? Because no. if you believe in atheism that what we do doesn't really matter, then why do good? Or what is right. it? Right. We could write a book. We could, yeah, it's awesome. Forrest could write a book on this. Uh, Forrest, <laughs> yeah. I can back pocket a lot of what I want to say, so f- go ahead. <laughs> Are you sure? Because I've got a, I got a bit. There's, there's a lot to it. Um, well, so I'll just say you, this. You quick. I'll it. just, I'll say this quickly because mine, mine might be brief, and I can just tack on. Uh, well, there's a, a number. I'll of write some... notes while you're talking. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we gotta we gotta weed through this. There's a couple of a lot of assumptions you're making there. Like, atheism wouldn't entail subjective morality. Uh, like I don't hold to moral realism or objective morality, but I just want to kind of let you know that there's a section of the audience that's not being satisfied. People that would be atheists, and in conjunction with that, uh, have a position like moral realism that there are objective moral facts and duties or whatever. Um, and so atheism right. doesn't entail that there aren't objective facts, morals and duties, and it doesn't entail moral naturalism. Uh, you, there are plenty of atheists out there. I mentioned actually one of them earlier who believes in like souls. They believe in like non-natural like value properties and stuff like that. Now, again, I don't hold these views. I can't argue for them, not views I hold. But it's important to distinguish that atheism doesn't entail uh, that someone has this view that we're, we're just animals and so there's no morality. Uh, they they could ha- they could right. have a robust view. You'd have to ask them. So I, that's I wanted to just start and lay, lay that out there that you're talking to two two people who I think we both agree on our meta ethical positions and mm-hmm. on our normative ethical positions. Uh, but um, you know that's just the side of there's atheists that won't be satisfied by that. And that's for sure I, for sure. Yeah, yeah. This is well, like we said in the last call. Atheism is just the position that there is no God. There are a lot of atheists out there that are going to disagree with everything we say. So but like, if you're asking just J. Mike and I, um, Lord, do I have so much stuff to say about what you just mm-hmm. said. Um, and I will cut it down and be brief as much as I can because I don't want to you know, dominate the airwaves here on this part. But um, you said a few things that, that I you know, take home bridge with. Um, the first thing you said is that you believe that morality... Or, or, Tell me again how you said this. You said that your morality comes from the Bible. Is that right? Or did you say that all morals come from the Bible? Okay, so what I believe is that God created God created the universe in six literal days and that he mm. gave humanity his word and that what we determine is good and evil comes from the Bible. And there's a lot of places that, you know, like within the Bible talks about what is good, what is wrong. And I've watched a little bit of the show and I know where like some of your guys' minds go to with some of this. Believe me, there's there's a lot of fun stuff to unpack in there too, right? But like, yeah, yeah, where, my mind yeah. is already my going. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Like I know there's a lot. Of, like in particularly, I've seen ones like uh, on the talk of slavery, right? Like I've seen you guys bring that yeah. one up. Like how does a good God uh, object? Like how does a good God solve slavery? And the historical context of slavery within the Bible is very different than what is we commonly think of here in the United States. Typically, yeah, with no. the civil rights movement. In different things. Nope. So a lot of what biblical slavery de- deals with in the historical narrative shows that it is contracted work. It was right. So Levi, just really quickly, I'm 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 just going to cut you off for a second, and I apologize for this. But like two things. Don't Number worry. one, you're that's simply not true. The Bible explains that you should buy slaves from the heathen among you. It talks about how to capture slaves from your enemies. It talks about slaves being property that are passed on to your children. It yeah. talks about beating slaves. Absolutely none of that has to do with contracted work. Slavery. Exactly. There there are certain times that the Bible uses the word slave when it really means indentured servant, especially when it's talking about Hebrew slaves. And a lot of apologists point to that. But there are also more than enough times where it talks about unwilling chattel slavery, where a person is your literal property. You're not going to get away from that. However, that is not the point of where we're going with this. You wanted to talk about morality, and I don't want to get distracted. So yeah. if it's all right with you, I'd like to just say you and I definitely disagree on that. We can come back to it if you want, but I'd like to move Ugh. back to the point of your call. I just don't want you to think sure. that I'm just saying, fuck you, you're wrong, and then moving on. Is is it all right if we move back? I'm uh, practicing really? self-control right now. Okay. Yeah, I just want to be clear that I'm, I don't want to, you know, just talk over you here. But uh, as far as, you know, morality coming from the Bible, 
that is something that we could have a whole conversation on. Because I think that if you actually derived your morality from the Bible, you'd be a hideous person. However, when it comes to where morality actually comes from, I want to point out two major things, Number, or actually three. Number one being the fact that non-human animals have plenty of morality. There, there's, there's lots of examples that we can see of what we sometimes call proto-morality, but what is for sure moral and ethical, inter, you know, uh, uh, altruistic social behaviors out in the animal kingdom. We see empathy, we see grief, we see fairness and equality, we see all sorts of things looking out at non-human animals. And we see the evolution of kind of cooperation and compassion when looking over human existence as well. Um, as far as where our morality comes from today, J. Mike and I are going to give probably similar answers to this. But if, if I can just speak for myself, um, my morality is rooted in human well-being. I understand that I am not the only thinking person in the room. I know what it feels like to be hurt. I know what it feels like to be sad. I understand that my actions have consequences on other people, and I wanna make sure that I'm leaving a good impression on the world around me. My goal is to try to make the whole world just a little bit less shitty than it is when I got here. And I understand that I have, you know, average human lifespan in this country, if you're lucky, is around 80 or so years. I'm 31. So I've already used up almost half of what I got. I have very little bit of time. I don't expect to be rewarded for anything that I do. I don't expect to be punished for anything that I do in the afterlife, I mean to say. Um, I just think that I have this one sliver of life and I'm gonna use it to try to make everybody else's life a little bit better. I think that that is a much more moral position than saying, if I'm good, I'll get a cookie and I'll get to live in this theme park. And if I'm bad, I'll get tortured in hell. I think that's, that's a very limited kind of moral development. Um, and then finally, I would point out the fact that, and I could go on to that for a lot longer as well. That's another thing that, again, J. Mike hit the nail on the head. We said we could write a book about this. That could be a 20 minute discussion in and of itself. Um, but then finally, I would just say that, you know, I, I am a, a nihilist in, in my philosophy. Cosmic nihilism specifically is a huge predominant part of, of my philosophical makeup. Um, I think that justice and morality and love and all and, and, and society and all of these things that we have going on are just constructs and illusions that we use to, to make meaning of our own life. And it makes absolutely no difference in the grand scheme of things. If this entire planet were wiped out in the most hideous way possible, it would mean jack shit for the galaxy Andromeda. It would mean nothing. You know what I mean? <clears throat> And so I don't think that humans are special. I don't think that earth is special. I don't think that anything is special. Um, and to your point at the beginning of the call, you said, why then, if, if we're just animals, if we're just nothing, should we behave well? But I think that level of freedom and that level of, of taking people down off the pedestal really puts the responsibility on you to not be an asshole. At the end of the day, if I ran around murdering and raping and doing all sorts of horrible things, like I said a minute ago, I don't think anything's going to happen to my soul because I don't think that I have a soul. I don't think there will be any punishment for it. If I go do heinous, hideous things and then kill myself, it's over for me. I receive no punishment. I'm done. And yet I choose to be a good person because I think that it's a good thing to do and it helps people around me and it makes them smile. And that's what I want to do with my life. So like that's that's the answer is I have the choice to be evil or not, and I choose not to, because I understand that other people are thinking agents, and I want them to be happy. But wouldn't that also kind of contradict, then, the concept of survival of the fittest? Because even, like, Survi the no. concept, like, within atheism and, like, doing good, because many animals have benefited their own... Their define, own species define, by define how you're using the concept. Putting up, defining which Sorry. concept. Well, yeah, just so that we don't talk past each other. When you say survival of the fittest, how are you using that term or those terms? So the benefit of a species for its own self or necessarily as an ind you can put that on an individual basis or you can put that on like a larger group. So like families or then go even larger to countries or a species as itself. Because if survival mm -hmm. of the fittest is the concept of what in if you believe then like the concept of evolution, animals developing, you know, the, the, the traits that are necessary for survival, offing off other ones uh, with negative traits for survival, then where does the morality come from? Would, that would be kind of my, where I would sit on it is that it doesn't have any sort of morality, right? 
Like, so what, the what other you, one has yeah. any necessary morality to back itself onto. Because then so you have what, people throughout history who look at what they did as the greater good versus right. other people. So comparing someone like Gandhi to Hitler, and I mean, that sounds horrible coming from me, but those were both two people who were completely convinced yeah. of their actions that they were doing the greatest good for themselves or for uh, others. Well, and one, of, kind of, one, of, one, of, one of them is... One of them is one of them at masses is destroying people's well-being and in another case the other one isn't so i don't want to see right. what, what those are it's not really comparing like a, you're comparing like a chevy to an orange yeah, exactly it's, see the thing is here like what you're doing is you're falling into a very 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 common trap of of taking evolutionary principles uh, like survival of the fittest which is by the way that that's a term that was come up uh, made up way after darwin to try to just give like a popular definition it, it's very largely misunderstood and it does more harm than good. Kind of like the Zalinger projection of like a monkey leveling up into a human. Evolution <laughs> doesn't work like that. And that kind of diagram sows more distrust and disinformation than actually what evolution actually teaches. But anyway, the, the, the whole concept of survival of the fittest, therefore, you know, what's best for my country, what's best for my, my, my whatever like that, that falls into what we call social Darwinism, which is bullshit. Um, it's, it's the idea that, you know, uh, uh, survival of the fittest. We we have to be the best species. We have to be the the top species. We have to be the dominant species, and also, therefore, we should be the dominant country, or we should be the dominant <laughs> race, and and shit like this. It, it's used to justify empiricism, racism, and and generally shitty behavior. People like Hitler strongly believed in social Darwinist principles, um, because social Darwinism isn't real fucking science. Um, so. What you've done here is you've fallen into a trap of saying, well, this works in nature, therefore I can apply these same very parochial rules to society and get something out of it, or to, to morality and get something out of it. And the two major issues with that is, number one, it's a gross misunderstanding of what evolution actually is and how it actually works. Altruistic behavior actually is an evolutionary trait. You know, working together as a group actually does have some benefit. Giving selflessly actually does have evolutionary benefit and there's different levels of that that are you know better suited for different environments um one of the rules of fitness which is you know when we actually talk about fitness we're not talking about like strength we're talking about like how well you fit into your niche and how well you survive in your particular environment um when we talk about fitness one of the first rules is when you gain fitness in one environment you necessarily lose fitness in another environment and altruism is no different it's something that gains fitness in one particular niche and it would actually be deleterious in another niche and that's fine um it just so happens that with a lot of animals especially mammals especially primates especially apes especially humans it's it's a really 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 good thing that actually benefits the survival of the species. Yeah, like um, uh, vervet. What is it? Vervet monkeys or what's yeah. they're called? Yeah, they they have that. They signal that like that alarm. I don't know. It's a call, right, for mm -hmm. predators. Yes, vervet. So like lots and lots of different uh, primate species have. This is actually one thing that we talk about when we study linguistics as well. Um, vervets and also Columbus monkeys. I think it is. Um, they have specific calls not only for what that that a predator is coming but what kind of predator it is and whether or not they saw it themselves or they heard it from that guy over there um and like this kind of thing is beneficial for the entire troop it's beneficial for everybody to know there's a predator not just this one you know primate because they live in a community together and it, um, and and so, it poses risk for sounding off something. yes because then the predator's looking at you exactly. um same thing you can right. talk about meerkats the same way they you know, they stand out on the edge of the hole they're putting themselves at risk so that they can tell everybody else when something's going wrong um so like and there's a million and one other examples that i give you both in the lab and in the field but like it's not really the point of the call uh, yeah. The point is, when we talk about this stuff, um, you know, moral behavior, ethical behavior, altruistic behavior do have evolutionary benefits. Um, and we can actually see their evolutionary history and we can see analogs and homologs in other animals as well. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's it, as an atheist and as a biologist, I do not feel necessary to say, well, the, the literature says this, therefore, I guess I won't rob a bank today. That's not necessary. However, it just so happens that, as is usually the case, science has a pretty cool bend to it that you know matches with being a good dude. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it, it just so happens that both are true. Okay, no, that's a really good explanation of it because a lot of uh, a lot of what I see like doesn't necessarily match within the atheist 
conception of morality. So it mm-hmm. is really interesting because I've never heard too many atheists there, speak the well, way they're speaking of. There isn't an atheist conception of morality, but I think I know what you mean. I just yeah. it's like a sticking point for me. I mean, I might just be being pedantic, but because um, when aren't you? Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's yeah. Unless you like really held to it and you were like doubling down, it's not really worth getting into that. Yeah. But um, yeah. I mean, and, and then one of the things. I mean, I don't want to have to shift this, but the thing that always kind of we talk about this, and then someone's kind of um. It's almost like I want to, I don't know if you know what a two quote K fallacy is, but it's almost like I want to invoke it when someone's like, yeah, but it's subjective and you hold to this thing. And it's, it all, it boils down to, you know, the, what you think your nature and, and uh, the stances that you take, it's all dependent on that. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I always want to invoke this two quote K and I'm like, why is that a, like, I'm going to take you down with me. Right. Because like I'm going to do a what about you type of scenario because on the theist view, it's typically based on God's stances or his nature and his nature's desires are reflective of his nature. And presumably there could be an entity with, with, yeah, there could be an entity that just ends up bottoming out at his desires or stances. Then it seems like a weird criticism to go, Hey, the subjective, because then I'm, I'm almost going, well, I'm going to take you down with me, so to speak, because you should have never made that criticism when it turns out that all of your moral facts bottom out at like whoever has the biggest stick. Right. Well, like for us as Christians, like we're, we believe that God is the creator of the universe and that he is the ultimate decider of what is good. And what we believe evil is, is basically almost any, well, it would be everything that he isn't right it's not that he designed good and evil it's just that he is good everything that he is not is evil and the bible is except a reflection the, of himself do, do, except for in the bible where he says that he creates all good and evil Just yeah. throwing that out there yeah, the, <laughs> he did say well, that as well okay i'm kind of confused you're saying he's Which good first? like what 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 would you expect like what would be your uh, let's just like intuition pump here okay like what would you expect if you saw somebody i don't know doing some hor- horrible like you know um, like you know, essaying somebody. I'm gonna try not to trigger anybody with with words that maybe that might be yeah. triggering for them. So we'll just say essaying somebody. And you go and you you right. you uh. Well, let's let's not use you either. Let's just say there's a bystander watching it, right? And yeah, they could stop it. They have the ability to stop it. Um, they're uh they could impede on that person's actions and, and prevent them from doing such an action. Do you think that what's expected of that person, the good action, what their obligation is, is that they should stop that person as saying the other person? Yes. And now this okay. is where the fun part begins, because this is also something like within the church that we recognize coming from your guys' perspective view. And I want to be respectful of your guys' uh, perspective of view either. So the argument would be then, if God is good, why doesn't he prevent all bad from happening? That would be your guy's well, sticking point. No, no, to well, the, no, 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 I'm not asking why doesn't he a good do God. it. Well, well, and you can phrase it in different ways. What I'm, what I'm trying to challenge, wouldn't you, on the hypothesis of a good God, wouldn't there be an expectation that they having the ability to intervene and that you agree that that's what the good thing is to do? We're not talking about schmud, right? We're not talking about like a different concept. We're talking about good. We're not changing mm-hmm. the concept. We're talking about we agreed on this concept good and it's applicable to the situation that i gave and we don't want to commit a fallacy of equivocation right we want to use those terms in the same way we don't want a special plead and we don't want to equivocate on good and turn out it means schmud so if under the right. hypothesis that there's a being uh, that has the ability to stop it wouldn't you expect them to and if there is just you know infinite well an infinite sorry innumerable my bad we can actually count them uh, but at such a high degree of these instances, wouldn't the expectation on the hypothesis of such a being not existing, right? Wouldn't you expect such a being to intervene lest, lest we equivocate on the term good? It would depend on if you believe if man has free will or not. If you believe that man does not have free will, then yes. So you're you just saying all things... Moral, like, all, sorry, all things considered, it's better for there to be free wills. No long as like evils... E- evils occur so long as we have free will. I mean, all you're saying is that there's context-specific 
such that it's best for God to have the world where uh, these things occur, right? I'm also curious, like, doesn't, does Satan have free will? I would say yes, because what we and, and know also, of, hold on, I'm sorry, in the Bible. If, Satan, yep, go ahead. if Satan has free will, Satan also knows for sure that God exists, so God absolutely has no excuse not to show up to all of us and say, hey, yo, I exist, because Satan absolutely knows he exists and still chose to rebel against him. So there is an issue. And also Satan still does bad things and God stops him. God stops Satan from doing bad things. That's the whole point of revelation. Is, 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 and so like, you know, God could still reveal himself to us, make it perfectly known that he exists and not leave it up to faith and could still stop bad things from happening. And we would still have free will. Satan is proof of that. Well, it depends on what your view is of, like, when you go into the design and the purpose of humanity, right? So when you look into it, the Bible says that God created Adam and Eve, and that they were in the garden perfect created beings, oh my right? Gosh. And they did enjoy the fellowship with God in the, in the garden. And when they sinned, they rebelled, because God. the reason that we are separated from God is not because, well, it's because that we sin. We do things that are wrong, right? The original creation state of man was to be with God. But when sin enters the world, that's what separates us from God. Okay. Now, God, hey, Levi, did, did, does God know everything? Does God know the past, the present, and the future? Yes. He does, does God know every, every, he knows everything that will ever happen. He knows the entire future. Yes. Okay, well, then he knew that they were going to sin. He put them in the garden, knowing that they would do the thing that he didn't want them to do, knowing who would go to hell, and he still made the situation that way. That means that their free will is, if it exists at all, you could argue that there is no real free will because they're already their fate's predetermined. God already knows it's going to happen. But even if you want to say they have free will, God already knew the outcome. So it's his problem. If, if, if I fuck up, but I knew that I was going to fuck up, I didn't really fuck up. I just did something wrong. I just did something stupid, right? If, if, if I drive down the road and my car says it only has 10 miles of gas in it and I tried to drive 100 miles, I can't be like, oh, how could my car have run out of gas on me? I should punish it. I should get a new car. What a terrible car that would run out of gas. I knew that was going to happen. I had the, ga the, 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 you know, the gas gauge right there. I knew that was a problem. That's my fault not the car's fault. So if God already knows the future, he can't be mad at us for doing the things that he knew we were going to do and had every opportunity to intervene with without taking away our free will, as I just addressed a second ago. That's all 100% on him. Also, if Adam and Eve didn't know what good and evil was because they hadn't eaten from the tree of good and evil and gained knowledge of that, how on earth could you blame them for doing an evil thing if they didn't know what sin was to begin with. If a baby pushes a big red button because he's a baby, and that happens to be the button that launches a nuke, you don't blame the baby for a war crime. It was being a baby. It didn't know the difference. So if humans didn't know what sin was and then did a thing that God knew they were going to do anyway, how could God possibly blame us? That is an incredibly irresponsible you know and narcissistic and stupid thing to do. So like, I'm sorry, you can't sit here and tell me that we have to preserve free will and allow terrible things to happen in the world because the thing that God already knew was going to happen happened and he did nothing to stop it. That's his problem, not our problem. Yeah, and so like, let me just real quick, I know we're going for a minute. I want you to respond, but I think we can squash this quickly. Uh, or if, like, why don't you respond? Then I can say, I can come in. On sure, this. sure. Yeah. Okay, so the argument then is, is that with the your guys idea with the the free will right like you guys would have problem with like the test in the garden of eden is written in genesis the first chapters of genesis correct Same yeah and i have an art would not present yeah. himself would not uh, allow that so my my argumentation of that would then be if there is no ever if there is never ever presented this whole uh, let me think how i want to word this i just want to do justice to what i'm going to say it's basically right. like, are you in a relationship because you have to be or because you want to be? So as a Christian, I believe that God does not create robots, right? And yeah. a relationship okay. is something that two people want to be in, right? Okay. So yeah. the idea that God creates these people without choice to choose him, like you're not in a relationship with 
I, 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 I'm so glad you what you're saying right because now. Because you want because, to be. Yeah, and I, I and hear what you're saying. The, that's where I would see the test, right? And they, they didn't know that it was wrong. God yes. told them that it was wrong. He said in the first couple chapters there, he said, of all the trees that you shall eat, you shall not eat of this tree. So they did know that it was wrong because it, it was told to them. They well, hold, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold no, on, hold on. Let's, let's back up. Let's back up real quick. Back up real quick. Back up real quick. So sure. let's go with the robot thing, right? Because this is this is important, right? So there's two, two issues. One, you think God can't do evil, right? Correct. Okay, great. So it's true that you can have an agent that can only do good and still be free. So we can imbue an agent with these two properties, the property of being free, having libertarian free will, and also always being able to do the good. So it just follows it's logically possible for there to be a being who is uh, free, uh, who always does the good. But but worse than that, right? Worse than that. Let me just ask you, you're a Christian, so you're a sinner, right? Yes. Great. The last time that you sinned, could you have freely done the good? Did you have freely done the yep, right choice? I definitely could have. Yep. How about the time before that? Yep. No, they're like when we sin, we do choose to sin. Every every, right? sing, every single yeah. choice. So I yeah, for every single time, every single uh sin, you had the free choice to do good. You just ended up freely choosing evil, right? Yes. Okay, great. So now it follows that for every for each agent, for each deliberation that they have. It's logically possible that each one of them freely do good, right? It is possible. Oh, well, okay. And it, it's logical. It, okay. Uh, yep. How do I want to? Is it, lo is, is it logically possible, right? For each, because it falls out for free. For each deliberation, you had the free choice to do good. So there is a possible world where everybody just does the good, right? Freely. It might be improbable. Like, you know, Kobe Bryant making every basketball shot or every NBA, NBA player making every, you know, shot they've ever made. But it's logically possible, right? I'd say that it's logically possible that in every situation, but I, it doesn't happen, right? Like, Okay, great, because, but great. But again, God, God is a, God is a being. The Bible hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Levi, you're going to have to listen. I just need the, I just need the yes. I don't need anything other than that. God is a being that can okay. that can instantiate any logically possible state of affairs, right? Sorry, repeat the question. God is a being that can instantiate any logically possible state of affairs, right? Yes. Great. So it's a logically pot. So we have premises. The argument. We have first premise that uh, a, log a logically possible world is a world where every agent could do evil, but they all end up freely doing good. We got a second premise, which is God is a being that can instantiate any logically possible state of affairs. And so now we have a conclusion. Uh, God could instantiate a logically possible world where every single person freely does good. There is evil, therefore that God does not exist. Right? He either desires that world with evil for a reason, and then it just makes it good. Because for whatever reason, evil's required in the world. It's a good thing. It's what should be done for whatever reason. Or he does desire that we freely come to him. That world was available to him. Mm -hmm. And he didn't, he didn't, he failed in respect to his intentions. Infallible beings can't fail with respect to their intentions. Omnipotent beings can't fail with respect to their intentions. And so we can just derive an argument that it doesn't exist or it desires evil in the world. That's the only way out of the argument, presumably. But to me, I would look at it more on the angle of something like along the lines of like a parent giving their child a test, an opportunity to to do good or to do wrong, right? And Every, it, everybody freely does good in that child. situation. Everybody does freely. It, it, look, he he has the file cabinet of every single, and we are running up on the calls. So we'll have to end it soon. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. No. He way. has the file. He has the file cabinet before he deliberates and makes the world. The first file is. Everybody but Forrest, or everybody does everything wrong, just sins mm -hmm. all the time. The next one, everybody but but Forrest in this one occasion, right, he does the good. The next file, he does, right, so on and so forth. Then the last file, right, is a file where we all freely do good. It's the last file there. God selecting for that file is no different than him selecting the file where you sinned last night, mm -hmm. right? Because he knows all of those outcomes ahead of time, like Forrest said. It's just whether or not he selects for one of those. Right, because you already put yourself in an, in a, a bind when God knows all of the future of all possible worlds. Either you uh, don't have free will, or we can 
throw that away and not worry about it for a second. And it's possible that God, that you could have freely done good and God could have selected that world and he didn't determine you to do it. And that, that really is the crux of it there, Levi, is like the, the question is, does anything ever happen that God doesn't want to have happen that's outside of God's control, that's outside of God's will? And if the answer is no, if every single thing that ever happens ever is because God wants it to happen and God can do no wrong and all this stuff, then as J. Mike's saying, God must necessarily want us to sin. He wants bad things to happen. He wants people to get raped and murdered and all these things. He w- that's part of the plan. And he wants people to go to hell because of it. He knows the outcome already. So he made certain people knowing that they would do terrible things and that they would not repent and that they would not believe in him and that they would go to hell. And he made them anyway. And that was part of the plan. If you believe that God is infallible and that he's all in control of everything, then it logically follows that he must want some evil to happen. And that's why he said, I heard you ask me quickly a while ago for the verse in Isaiah 47, uh, 45, 7, Isaiah 45, 7. He says, I form the light and create darkness. I create peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So even in the Bible, it says he makes good and he makes evil. He wants evil to happen. I'd have to go to that verse because, again, like, yeah. And, I mean, I know that's a bit of a a bit of a cop-out. I'm not super familiar with the passage. But, no, I do appreciate that challenge. What, that whether whether or not that's what the verse says, the logic still stands. What J. Mike said is a completely, like, solid thing. That's We've been long on this call, but I was not ending it for a second because, like, I was – J. Mike, you and I had this conversation in Austin, yeah. and I was listening to everything you're saying. I'm over here like, yeah, work the body, work the body. <laughs> so, like, yeah, just – I, 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 do you, I, this will be your, the last thing. I, well, here, I, like this, I like this call. I mean, he's been, yeah, been good. Yeah. I, sorry. Yeah, this we, has been, we might've rambled a little bit. So apologies to you. No, uh, this has been fantastic. I'll, I'll and I, I want to hear your, your answer, Levi, really right quickly before we wrap up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think this has been a fantastic call and quickly before we wrap up, Levi, like, do you have anything to say to that? That, that as J Mike said, God logically could have made a world where every single person has free will and still does only good things, and yet he deliberately chose to make a world full of sin and evil and starvation and death and disease. This is the world he picked on purpose. Is that okay with you? My, is that something that you think is good? N- no, because I don't think then I don't think that that truly is the. I don't think that is a world with free will. Like again, kind of, and I know we got to kind of wrap this up. So I guess the kind of yeah. thesis statement of. So that question would be, you can't have free will if you have limited options, right? That's not free will. If your only free will is that, you know, you can only do good, it does, it's not a free will, right? You either have the option to choose or to reject, to do good or to do bad. To do good or to do good, that's not a position of free will. And I don't think then that Christians or anyone could have a true relationship with God in the truest sense of a relationship if the only options were in, in, in that were world, there's, good a, there's an good. option to do evil in all of them, but yeah, we will run yeah. over if I, yeah, that is absolutely. That, yeah. So. But Levi, please call back next time. J Mike or I are on uh, preferably both. And, and like, we would love to dig into this more because like, I think, I think you just went back on what you said a little bit and I'd like to challenge you on it, but we've already been on this call for 33 minutes, but thank you so much for calling in. Seriously, please call we'll back do, again. Okay. Thank you so much. It was yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Right. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Be Bye-bye. safe. Hey, all of you people listening out there in the world, are you still sitting there biting your nails, dying to know what I was supposed to tell you after the first call? Well, now's the time. It's finally come. Uh, Did you know that we have a brand new and exciting way to support the ACA? You can buy a custom engraved brick and become a part of the library's legacy. Uh, Check out this video about it. Have you ever wanted to make a permanent impact on the atheist community of Austin? Help support our space for free thought by buying a custom engraved brick to be laid on the building grounds to help raise funds for improvements. Our building has stood as a beacon for years, bringing people together. But three years of emptiness due to the pandemic have taken a toll, leaving it in disrepair. Help us restore this hub of connection and support by buying a brick. Moses had his stone tablets, but we're doing our own version. Join our brick fundraiser and let your engraved messages stand the test of time minus commandments visit tiny.cc forward slash aca bricks for more information 
It's a super exciting thing that absolutely anybody can do. So definitely look into that. Uh, we also have a tremendous amount of super chats that have been building up. So I'm going to dig through those very yeah. quickly and then we'll jump in. We've actually got two calls that I'm very excited about because one is a direct challenge to you and one is a direct challenge to me. And so like, I want to hear like both of these calls here. Oh. Um, so we've got uh, two pounds from Sean Isherwood. That property of pi is conjectured, not yet proven. Right. I did. I was sure to say that it's a theoretically they, they, you could find any possible number in pi. Theoretic. It logically follows that it's an infinite string of every possible permutation. Therefore, it's a. But because it's an infinite string of every possible permutation, there is no way we could ever possibly truly test that and prove it. So theoretically, that's the case. Um, then uh, we've got uh, uh, what is that? Gay is husky. Uh, Five dollars. Uh, if I had a drink for every time an apologist was honest, I'd be Mormon again. Thank you so much. Um, we got Siggy Sigwald uh, gifted a bunch of super chat, uh, a bunch of memberships. Thank you so much. You gifted fifty memberships. That's amazing. And then you sent one hundred arses. I'm not sure what ARS is for. I'm gonna say that's probably. Argentinian rupee snacks is what that is. Thank you. But you sent a bunch of them. So thank you so much. It's incredibly generous of you. Thank you. Uh, J Mike plus Forrest plus Hail Sagan. I love that. Um, and then you sent another one with 20 of your Armenian rupee snacks saying, uh, I'm the Oprah of memberships. And you get a membership. And you get a membership. Uh, Thomas Gallipoli. Uh, sent a dollar ninety nine. Uh, Forrest and J. Mark are awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do. That's very kind of you. Um, we got uh, Miranda Rensberger. Uh, probably sent that wrong. Ten dollars for the eighty zillionth time. If you need a god to tell you not to hurt people, you are not a moral person, man. <laughs> I could like I seriously, we could have done the entire show with that one call. <laughs> Just talking about morality and all the ways you don't need a god for it. Um, then we got nine ninety nine from Hobby Woods, uh, ten nine ninety nine just because I love J Mike and Forrest. That's very kind of you. Um, Halo Master twenty uh, one two four three sent uh, fifty Canadian dollars. Uh, are they even dollars? Uh, I'm so glad that I found this channel, and I'm so thankful for the good you do in the world. Uh, you said that you shouldn't go over time, but the more I get to see uh, you, the more I actually found. What? Oh, sorry. You say I shouldn't go over time, but the more I see, get to see you, the better I actually, the more I get to see you, the better. This man used no punctuation. The more I get to see you, the better. I actually found Forrest first, then this channel. Also, always great to see J. Mike, a little happy guy there. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, less than Lucid sent $6.66. I'm, I'm guessing that's an owl, the O-W-O. -O. What's this? It's Ace Awareness Week. I didn't know that. All you asexuals are valid and loved platonically. I love that addition. I have a couple of ace friends. That's awesome. I didn't know that was a thing. Uh, Thomas Gallipoli sent another $4.99. Caller, what version? Pro tip, if your book says version, then it's not a word-for-word a word -word translation. It's an interpretation specifically to fit an agenda. If Seriously. It is that this book is absolutely true, or at least this version of it is. Uh, five nine uh, five dollars from some random madman. Did I finally catch Forrest and J. Mike live on Atheist Experience? Love you both. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much. It's very kind of you. Um, and then finally, we just got nine ninety nine from P Power. Uh, hi, Forrest. Forrest Falcai Nation, rise up, man. I don't want a nation. Uh, it's a strange. It's a strange situation. Although when I rise to power, uh, we're destroying Mercury first. Um, so we've got a bunch of other calls here that we got to get through. And as I said at the beginning of all that, um, we have two in particular that I want to run through. And it, the show may run a little bit over because of it. We'll try to keep it tight. Mm -hmm. um, we have one that's a direct uh, challenge to you and one's a direct challenge to me. I'm going to start with a direct challenge for you. Um, this is Rick, pronouns he, him, from Canada, wants to address J. Mike's assertion that J Jesus was a failed apocalyptic preacher. Here we go. Rick, you are on AXP. How are you doing? Hey, I'm great. How are you guys doing? Awesome. Doing good. good. How are you doing, Rick? Good. I'll just sit over here. Yeah, no, I... I <laughs> yeah, so I hear you talk a lot, J. Mike, that you think Jesus is a failed apocalyptic preacher. And it's based on the two verses from the Gospels, correct? We got Luke 9, 27, Matthew 16, 28, and Mark 9, 1, right? Uh, some uh, stand there, which are not tasting death. That's, well, it's not inaccurate to, to list, yeah, to list uh, Mark 9, 1 or Luke 9, 27. Uh, but 
uh, that's not all that I use. Um, it's a okay. Okay. Can we address yeah, those two first then? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So where he says I uh, am the, um, he says some standing here which shall not taste the death until they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom, right? So throughout the Gospels, George, uh, Jesus is constantly stating well, yeah, um, uh, that, that you don't die, right? Sorry? The verse is truly, I tell you, that's coming so into, in, into the not, kingdom, yeah. The in, well, but in, yeah. in power, it matters because part of my argument is in Luke, I think it's 927. Part of my argument, well, it's not really my argument, but part of the argument is um, the in power is gone in Luke's, and that's a very significant piece of my argument. So it's a, oh, the wording. Yeah, well, they were, trans, they were translating. So, so how is the in power versus coming into his kingdom? How is that? How is that? Uh, yeah. How does so, that in, anything? Can you explain it? Yeah, because in Mark's gospel, Mark is seeing Jesus as um, fulfilling a role. So, like in there's a lot here. So in what's called the intertestamental period, um, the between before the, the, I guess, Pauline epistles and the last books of the Jewish Bibles or Jewish Bible would, um, you had Jews being at this point, um, they were oppressed by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Ptolemies, the Kings, Persians, Romans, Greeks, right? Um, and so there's this kind of this notion of like, you know, we've been getting our ass kicked, you know, we're supposed to be God's chosen people. And so you get a lot of these kind of apocalyptic writing about uh, at, in the intertestamental period, talking about how we need to turn from foreign ways and the kingdom of God is going to come. Uh, you, know, you might hear one, like a son of man, you know, uh, is going to come is going to come and establish their kingdom because uh, these powers of evil that have been, uh, in, in place, right? Don't think that you've sided with the evil and gotten away with it. God's going to come as a literal kingdom in power and cast people up into judgment. And you'll either enter his kingdom or you won't, you'll be cast away. And so Jesus's first words in Mark, uh, which I, I'm, I have to look up the verse, but it's something to the effect of the time has, uh, the time has come, um, prepare for the way, uh, repent, for, repent now because the, the good for the good news is here or something to that effect. And so the end power matters because his his view of Jesus is a is an apocalyptic one. Uh, same with John John the Baptist. They share a message Jesus and John do about this kingdom of God that's going to come, and hence why his ethics and his parables express urgency. And so in Luke, the end power is removed, and the reason why that's important is that when you have like Jesus talking to the high priest, I guess it'd be Caiaphas and Mark, he tells. Uh, he tells the high priest, I am the son, of, I am the Messiah, and you will see, or you will be here, you will see the son of man coming on clouds with great power. He tells him this. Luke, it's gone. And you also get this other verse, Luke 17, 20 through 21. It's only unique to Luke. So it doesn't pass the criterion of multiple attestation. It's a verse that says something to the effect of when talking to the Pharisees, uh, uh, Jesus was asked, what will the kingdom of God be like? Well, it, or Jesus, Jesus tells the, the Pharisees, the kingdom of God will not be something that will be observed. It won't be something, quote, where you say, here it is, or there it is, for the kingdom of God is already in your midst. And so in Luke, the way Luke sees Jesus and sees the kingdom of God is not coming in its power. It's coming in its ministry, in, its, in the spiritual notion of Jesus's ministry. It's present within Jesus's ministry. And the reason that's important is because Luke and John are writing after this that generation would be over. And so they have to reinterpret what's being expressed in Mark's account, right? An apocalyptic one to fitting a spiritual notion. Hence why the high priest no longer will see it. Hence why that's gone. And hence why you get these lines that are unique. So the in power is very crucial to my claim that the later gospels mute the apocalyptic message and later spurn against it in John and gospel of Thomas. Okay. Yeah, no, so... So that that's them trying. They were trying to comprehend what Jesus was saying, and that's that's apparent. Like when Jesus uh, raises the little girl, right? That she dies, and he says she's not dead; she's sleeping, and they all laugh. Then with Lazarus, he says he's not dead; he's just sleeping. And even his disciples said, like, like, what are you talking about? He's dead, right? And then Jesus actually starts crying in that verse. So Jesus was constantly trying to help people understand this. So the fact that it says power and kingdom. 
is just man's trying to understand what Jesus was teaching them. It doesn't necessarily mean different interpretation. Well, the Jews well, hold on, hold on. Or like you said, a literal kingdom, right? Yeah, so but, yeah, but, so but what, what, are you, what, what are you? What are you using? What are you using? Because so with what I'm using, this is an important piece. It's not enough to just cite like proof text from the from the Bible and just say, "Hey, well, Jesus says this." The reason why I'm pretty confident that an oral tradition or Jesus said, assuming Jesus existed, that Jesus said something like the effect of Mark nine one, uh, for example, uh, or other verses, is because they pass the criterion of dissimilarity. And that doesn't mean if it doesn't like it, Jesus didn't say it. But it's a critical analysis. It's a critical lens for me to raise the probability. My arguments, it's history. My argument's probability based, right? It's inference to the best explanation. And so I, when you cite those verses, are you running it through an abductive filter like the criterion of dissimilarity? Because if not, it won't, from my, I'll just be honest, from my vantage point, I won't feel like any damage. This is the common theme I get when I run this argument. No damage seems to be done my way because people will just cite these red lettering. And I don't agree that Jesus said like, majority of that right so we have to employ uh, independent attestation or contextual credibility um or criterion of uh, uh dissimilarity otherwise i it just seems like you're just citing stuff at me and not giving a critical analysis do, do you understand what i'm saying like is that I, I i understand i understand what you're saying but what I, I think the difference in our argument here is i believe jesus was somebody that comprehended what humans couldn't and that's apparent in those verses I quoted, right? Because these people didn't understand what he was saying, and that's where the confusion comes in. Whereas uh, you don't believe Jesus knew anything other than what humanity knew, right? But if you look at the red letter Gospels, whether you believe it's true or not, whatever the story is telling, Jesus was claiming things that they couldn't comprehend to the point he even started crying about yeah, it. But how do you, but but how do you know which red lettering Jesus... How do you know which red lettering Jesus ah. likely said, as opposed to uh, text that comes from people putting words on the lips of Jesus? That's the whole point, what? right? That's what. That's how the whole do you point know which one he didn't say, right? I could throw that right back yeah, at that, you, right? Yeah, yeah, you're you're making an no, assumption. No no, that no, that, no, 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 no. I'm glad you asked that. That's that's yeah. I would hope that you would ask that. That's what I'm saying, right? I have a critical lens that I'm applying. I can't. It's a self-imposed criteria that scholars use, right? I'm not saying it's like there's this floating thing. We have to use this. And I grabbed it. It's self-imposed, but we have to have a critical analysis. We have to get off the ground in some way. And yes, the Luke, right? Luke 17, 20 through 21. What, that verse I told you about saying that the kingdom of God is not going to be observable. It won't be a literal kingdom of God, a literal judgment. Right? That verse is important that that's only unique to Luke because it doesn't get independent attestation. That's one mark. It doesn't pass the criterion of dissimilarity. It's precisely a theological. Uh, it's it, it's precisely what you would expect to be stressed as a theological point or reinterpretation. It's like one of the most clear cut things that you could use from from my view. And so that me discarding those is not saying Jesus didn't say that. It's that it I can raise the probability that it's more likely that that people are attributing sayings to Jesus that he never did for theological reasons because they took stock in the fact that Jesus said that the the kingdom of God would come in their generation. Paul himself in 1 Thessalonians 4, 4, 14 through 18 himself says, we are going to be taken up. He thinks it's going to happen in his lifetime. Jesus starts his ministry out with John the Baptist, who's apocalyptic. The end of his ministry is, uh, has apocalyptic people like uh, Paul writing about it, believing in that. And then the keys to the beginning of his ministry and the end of his ministry fits really nice when you apply this criteria or criterion, um, and apl apply dissimilarity to it or independent attestation, because at that point you can weed in and weed out what's most likely goes back to that oral tradition. And that's what, that's the project I'm interested in. I'm not interested in a regressive research project. Okay. So, so that, that being said, right, you quoted, so Paul said that, which if, if we want to read it, I, I think it's more likely that Paul understood what Jesus was saying because he almost quotes him verbatim. So how did Paul get those words if the gospel didn't exist? How did Paul know that Jesus said such a thing if the gospel because, didn't exist? Yes, right? because, okay, that's, that's my point exactly, right? The whole point that I'm saying is, right, to sum up the argument in a really easy way, the beginning of his ministry starts out apocalyptically because he's, uh, 
He's uh, he could have started with the fourth philosophy, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, but no, he has a, a common message aligned with John. And if you read the Acts, right, laid firmly at the root of the tree, as, as John says, um, he's a, clearly apocalyptic. He aligns that message. The end of his ministry, believers also have that same belief. So Paul, it's no surprise Paul persecuting Christians would come to such a view of Christianity. I mean, in order for him to become a Christian, he has to know something about it, right? Or, well, Christianity, for him to come to a believe in Jesus is his savior, died and resurrected, right? Whatever Paul's beliefs are, right? That he had such an experience. That's not, that, that's not just coming out of thin air or from his, you know, experience that he has. It's coming from uh, his interaction with Christians. And so that fits my argument. Early Christians had an apocalyptic message like Paul, hence why Paul believes that. And later uh, believers Right, since that that it wasn't fulfilled, had to reinterpret that message as a spiritual notion, and that's why when I get on TikTok and do lives, there's still the Christian that rolls into the room and says, "Repent now, Jesus is coming any day." They, and I realized this earlier today, actually. Christians are a lot like their Jesus, in one special sense that he was wrong about the kingdom of God coming in his generation, and every Christian after has been wrong about it. So, but but Jesus uh, Jesus gave and like in the next verse, uh, Matthew twenty four, Jesus gives a specific criteria of what will happen in that generation, right? So he's laid out what's going to happen. How people interpret it is irrelevant. Jesus knew yeah. something that we didn't know, and repent for the kingdom of, uh, of heaven is at hand. I mean, this is God talking to us, right? What is time to God? And Jesus says that he tells lots of verses to be ready. If you know the hour, you're not going to be ready, right? He has a whole parable about that right, about the man in his house, and it's constantly saying, be prepared, you never know when it's coming, right? So to tell them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand is so that they wouldn't start slacking, so they would continue on the mission, on the goal, looking forward to Jesus coming back. What, okay, so I will have to say, we'll we'll, we'll move on soon, I want to have Forrest engage. I don't feel like you're really, like, I appreciate you calling, I don't feel like you're applying any actual objection, you're just giving conjecture on what you think could is it an alternative hypothesis or explanation? That's fine. I expect that. I expect that people are going to come up and disagree and have a different view, but why would it mean anything to me if there's no, nothing substantive or critical analysis, right? What, how would, how does that, how could that move me? Especially if I feel like I have a critical analysis, maybe I'm totally wrong, right? I don't want to incite this like level of um, hubris or something, but at the same time, you know, I, I want to play a game where I'm on the same level. I don't, I, I'm not, I can't have it where someone offers up a view and it doesn't seem like it's, oh, hey, the, the reason why I know Jesus said this is it passes dissimilarity or here's this other self-imposed imposed, uh, historical an- analysis that I have, right? And we can go through that. You, you see what I mean? Like, I don't, this is the same kind of frustration I that I'm having in this conversation that it it's like, it's not being met at the bar that I think it should be met at. And, and it makes me, it makes me understand why people believe what they believe. That, that's fair. But see, what I feel like is happening here is we have a text from the first debatable first century, right? That we, it's almost verbatim today, pretty close. There are some dissimilarities, but it's pretty close. And I feel like you're debating those words out of that book, or sorry, dismissing those words out of that book, uh, for different interpretations when it should be right out of the text. Whether you believe Jesus existed or not, we're arguing from the text. So you can't dismiss the text and say, let's argue outside of it and assume it wasn't said, right? Jesus was real. He wasn't real. This is what it says. You have, you have, you, 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 you can't just use the text and just say, yeah. Jesus said this, right? You have to apply a critical, li- like, if you just think Jesus said that, I'm just going to ask you, what's the justification for that? That's going to be applying a critical lens. And I think what we should do is apl- we should do that. Otherwise, if you're just content, just going, Jesus said that, that's red lettering. Your standards of evidence are a lot lower than mine. That's you're entitled to that. Uh, I can't, I, I don't know. I don't know how to move you. Right. But, but I will be, I will be honest with you. You're not going to move me with this type of a response. I just, man, we, I've, I've been sitting here just listening for the past 15 minutes and, and this whole time, you know, forgive me for paraphrasing, has been, well, Jesus said that the end is going to come real soon. And then we've been like, all right, well, it hasn't, though. And like, yeah, but he said it. 
Right, but it's been 2,000 years since he said it, and he said it was going to happen within his lifetime, and then it didn't happen. Uh, yeah, but he said it. We are sure. We could argue whether or not he actually said it or how you know that he said it, but the fact is that it hasn't happened, and you're like, yeah, but he said it. And it's like, yeah, okay, uh, sure. But like, that we're still here, and the apocalypse hasn't happened, and he said it was going to happen within his lifetime, and it was going to happen within his disciples' lifetime, and his disciples said it was going to happen within their lifetime or the next person's lifetime, <laughs> and for the past 2,000 years, every single generation of Christians has been saying it's going to happen within our lifetime. 44% of Americans today believe that the apocalypse will happen within their lifetime, within the next 50 years, and I guarantee to you it won't because it hasn't happened the other 2,000 years, and we're just sitting it's just round and round for 15 minutes like yeah but he said it cool he said he said something and then it didn't happen he said something wrong it, 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 what where do we go from I, I swear to i'm gonna walk into the ocean if i have to hear it and i'm in oklahoma which is a long way from the ocean it's gonna be difficult but like <laughs> this is again and again it's like yeah but he said it yeah, okay but did it happen though if i say the moon's made of cheese and we go to the moon and we find it's not made of cheese does that make me right because i knew something you didn't or does that mean i was just fucking wrong <laughs> So, so Jay, Mike, you're, you're quoting the Bible in these parts to say that Jesus failed. But then when I say, let's dive into the context of the book you're quoting, you say, no, that book's irrelevant. Because you, you, it, you, it, you it, don't know. Because, because you don't. Because, because don't reality understand. exists outside of the Bible. Yes. And we can, check, we can check what happened. Yeah, yes, we're, like we, we're, we're the just Bible, in, right? We're, you can't yes, yes, the Bible fucking, and say that it just. Look, do you think? Do you think Shakespeare? Do you think scholars of Shakespeare just read sh like just like <laughs> that's it? Like they don't do a they don't have a critical lens on it. Like maybe did Shakespeare say this? Like I was gonna, I was gonna say in 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 the Lord of the Rings, Gandalf says a wizard is never late. He arrives precisely when he means to. And then later, when Frodo is in Rivendell, healing from being stabbed by the, uh, the, the 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 Morgul blade, he's like, "Where were you, Gandalf?" And Gandalf says, "I'm sorry, Frodo. I was delayed." How did he say that? If he if he if he says that a wizard is never late, how could he have been delayed later? It doesn't fucking matter because this is reality, and that's the book, right? So like, we can't say, "Yeah, but he said it in the book." We have to check. What's really going on? So if Jesus said this is going to happen and then it didn't, we can't sit here and say he wasn't wrong because he said it. Like that's, that's not. If you put that in conjunction with Luke's version of the kingdom of God being spiritual, John mentioning it, like I think John chapter three, and that's it. I'm, I could be, someone fact check me on that, but I'm pretty sure it's like kingdom of God is like mentioned like one time in John chapter three and that's it. And then the kingdom of God just becomes, I think in John chapter 11, just like, you know, having eternal life and, and, Right. So then the Gospel of Thomas, right, later, we have uh, sayings, Jesus say, sayings from Jesus. Well, obviously, you're not going to agree that they're sayings, but the point is not whether they came from Jesus. It's the point is that here are people at the time and how they are thinking. Sayings three and sayings 118 specifically are addressing like anybody that thinks the kingdom of God will come in the sky, the birds will go before them. Anybody that thinks that the kingdom of God will go in the water, the fish will go before them. Right. In other words, he's they're saying anyone that thinks the kingdom of God is going to be this literal thing, they're wrong. You don't spurn against a view unless people before you held the view or people currently hold the view. And so when you look at this constant muting and then spurning against the view, and then you go and you look at what Paul says and what Jesus says and what passes the, the, the critical lens that I'm offering, it seems very clear. And I think someone like Albert Schweitzer, who was writing in 1906 with his book, which has been influential for scholarship, The Quest of the, for the Historical Jesus, he's made the most crucial point that most scholars hold to. We have to place Jesus in his first century Palestinian context. Most Christians don't do that. They don't do that with their own religion. And that's why a lot of Jews and you don't agree on what the son of what the term son of God even means or or Messiah. Right. And so there's it's sorry, I'm going on a soapbox, but it matters. We have to place it. And that's that's that right there. That's the criterion of contextual credibility. We have to put it in first century Palestine. We can't put it in like, you know, you know, in in 16th century England. Right. Mm -hmm. So it does Jesus, matter to this apply gospel, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached all across the world as a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. We're going to put that in Palestine? Like, we're going to put that in early Jerusalem? Oh, my God. Let's just right? move on. Many false Christ guys arrive. Not it. Like, this guy's track anything. There's a criteria. Said, let's, yeah. let's move to your... Let's move I did. To, uh, You're just dismissing the Bible, but using the Bible. It's insanity. It's, 
where he's dismissing <laughs> the Bible using objective reality outside of the Bible. And like he's been doing it for 20 minutes. And it's it's man, it's rough to see. But I tell you what, Rick, yeah. uh, we'll move on to the next call. I I think Jay, Mike, you good? Like this is all you. So um, if you're I'm, no, I'm hundred percent. Yeah. I'm, so we'll just go ahead and I'm move sure, on. I'm, but I'm sure if we force, I'm sure if we lasted longer, that the objection would be forthcoming. I'm really sure it would be. Yeah, so. if, after maybe after 40 minutes, we would we would find the actual meat of the issue. But as of this moment, oh, do we have a show to do? Um, really quickly, we got a couple more little announcements for you guys and a couple more crew, uh, 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 super chats as well. Uh, first of all, we want to send a big thank you to the crew. The crew are fantastic. Can we get the crew cam up for a second? They're the ones who put this show together. Look at all them. Love them. They're the ones who put this show together every single week. Uh, they're awesome. We love them all very much. Leave it up. No, leave it up. Don't give them a break. Dude, Keep Kirby. them on camera. Just make them as uncomfortable as possible. You live here now. This show is all about you. We're just going to do uh, the, next, the next, like, 30 minutes. Just, like, <laughs> just leave it this way. We're just we talk. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're fantastic. I seriously appreciate all of them. They're, they're really, really great. So thank you to the crew. Also, if you happen to be in the Austin area just next week, October 29, 2023, uh, please join us for live broadcasts of Talk Heathen and the Atheist Experience. Talk Heathen will be hosted by Christy Powell and Johnny P. Angel. Love those two guys. And the Atheist Experience will be hosted by Johnny P. Angel and Sophia Spina. Love those two guys, too, but I love Johnny P. Angel twice in that, and they cancel out. Screw you, Johnny. Uh, doors open at noon, and we hope to see you there. So come on down. Uh, parking is just wherever you can find a legal spot. It's a small parking lot, y'all, so get there early. It's a lot of fun. Um, with that, uh, oh, flip super chats too. Uh, wait a minute, 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 wait a minute. I'll find, I swear to glob, I'll find it. It's on here somewhere. There's a lot. There it is. That was the last one, I think. Jimmy Jr. sent $4.99. Great host, great crew. Thank you very much. Um, William Mates sent uh, $2.00. Forrest, how does it feel to be the next Bill Nye? That's very kind of you to say, but I don't want to be the next Bill Nye. I want to be the first best Forrest Valkai you've ever fucking seen. Um, and then we've got uh, Sono Zaki as a new member. Thank you very much for that. Sent $5 to say Mercury's days are numbered. We'll name the first bulldozer we land there, Forrest. Can't love that enough. Um, uh T T A is it Tau software or T A zero software? I don't know. Um, Tantalum O software uh, sent five dollars uh, to my fellow globe heads. You know who you are. Love that. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about being round earther, not a flat earther. That's great. Um, Raymond Maynard sent six dollars and sixty six cents. Next time you. Sorry, first time able to catch the show live. You do a great job here. Thank you so much. That Thank really you. means a lot. Uh, and those are all the super chats. Dang, uh, hey, oh, we can move on to the next thing too. And uh, and now we've got another call. Like I said, this one is a direct challenge for me. Uh, I think we can be quick about this one though, because I, sure. I, I I'm just reading the reading the prompt here. I'm not sure. Uh, this is Mike, pronouns he him, calling him from Canada. Thinks that Forrest is inconsistent about definitions regarding trans people and animals in the Bible. Uh, Mike, who isn't Jay, Mike, you are on the Atheist Experience. How are you doing today? I've never had a bad day in my life, Forrest. Thanks for asking. I love that. Love that. So what's going on? Yeah, what, what, which specific things do you think I'm inconsistent about with these topics? Absolutely. I don't mean to start this confrontational, but no, not at all. you question Gandalf, one of the Maiar and a member of the Astari Order? There's a difference between... Right. Uh, so a wizard arriving exactly when he means to says, I'll tell you I'm coming at six but he knows he's going to show up at seven. So he meant to get there when he says he was delayed getting to Frodo. He was getting there as fast as possible, but something got in his way. His destination was delayed by Saruman possible. Something came up, uh, but you're right. Uh, we'll try to keep it tight. So let's not, uh, let's not do the <laughs> order. <right>. So, uh, <laughs> right. Um, so one of the things that, uh, what happened was I was listening back to a show uh, a few months ago that you were on and you had two calls. One mm -hmm. call, someone was calling in saying, are asking about uh, trans people and how can mm -hmm. you have, uh, and they were saying, well, we have this strict definition, trans people, like men are men, women are women. How can you uh, switch that? We have this definition. And your response, I, I might be misquoting you a little bit here, but was along the lines of these things are categories that we create. And that's 
you still roughly agree with that? Genders by modal, uh, genders are categories we kind of invent. Are you asking me if I still hold to that that ideology or that that idea? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so gender is spectral, um, and gender is something that varies from culture to culture, from generation to generation, from person to person, from day to day. So, because of that, it it's impossible to say a man is this and does these things and 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 acts these ways and a woman is this and does these things and acts these ways um because it's going to change in 50 years it's going to change in a different part of the world it's going to change from one person to the next within the same community within the same you know time frame so like it's it's not something that you can just pin that way um because especially because of of you know gender performance theory um gender is something that we do more than something that we are. Uh, and so it's, it's just, it's a set of uh, beliefs, behaviors, and, 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 and actions that are socially constructed. Uh, and therefore it cannot be, but we, we can't quantify gender is what I'm saying. We can't, we can't, you know, have a, there's no qualitative or quantitative thing that we can sit here and say, okay, this, this has X, Y, Z characteristics. Therefore it is a woman. That doesn't make any sense. It, it's just a state of being that we put different labels on that we are labeling what's going on in the world. You know what I mean? That's, that's the point that I was getting at there again. You know, I, I know you don't have the exact quote of what I said. I don't either, but like, that's how I would summarize that general idea at this particular moment. Uh, and then you think I'm being inconsistent with it. I'm assuming I said something different at a different time that maybe, maybe I was unclear about what, what's going on with that. Well, and well, here's the thing is that the, Inconsistency. So I just want to flesh out a little bit more of that, and then we can touch on it uh, if that's okay. But the, sure. I, mean, I don't know if I super agree with the performative nature of gender. I think that there are trans people that are what they are, regardless of if they perform it or not. Um, well, to, to be clear, when I say performative, I don't mean putting on a show trying to convince other people. I mean that what, what I mean by performative is that gender is. An, ex an outward expression and an action as much as it is an internal feeling and sensation. It's something that you do okay, so in the world. So I'm not saying that trans people are playing dress up. I'm saying that all people with any gender no, 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 no. are, are, you know, doing a, an action of being the gender, not just having the internal sensation that gender performance is, is applying to everybody. But what I'm saying is that a, a, like a trans femme person, who isn't out to anyone and still presents mask is still trans. It is still a, it's still a woman. They're still yes. a woman, even if they yeah, don't perform absolutely. any feminine behaviors. So that's the, just this little thing I have with the performative definition of gender, because someone yeah, so be a woman and, if they don't perform any outward behaviors of being a woman. Yeah. May, maybe the word women. performance is, is mis misleading. It's, it's, the, the idea of gender performance is that it is something that is displayed in your daily habits. It's something that you are doing all the time. It, it doesn't mean that somebody can't still be closeted or anything like that. It, 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 it's just an addition to, you know, gender as a feeling or as, as something that's inherent or internal. Um, it's, it's the way we describe gender as a set of cultural norms as opposed to just a set of you know, a, a personal identity or, 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 or feeling. Um, so it's, it's the way that we describe when we talk about gender theory and like a cultural standpoint. So like, yeah, it's, it's, you are absolutely right. A trans woman who is not out, who is, you know, still dressing and presenting masculine, who is, is, you know, uh, not socially transitioning or anything like that. Of course, there's still a woman because that none of those things apply to womanhood or manhood or anything like that. Those are, I, you you could make the argument they are performing masculinity, but it would that would only lead to more confusion if you were to phrase it that way. Right. Well, yeah, and and that's not that wasn't even the thing that I wanted to. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. But the <laughs> thank you. Uh, the the thing about it is that in this conversation, and mm -hmm. you can. If anything I say is not what you feel right now, just correct me. Like I'm not holding it anything. Is that um, when we come up with what is a man or a woman or NB or anything around that spectrum, 
these are definitions that we are deciding. Because you said something, I, I, I really like the line, you said like, um, nature is fuzzy and gray and we try to put boxes on it to make definitions. That sounds like some shit that I would say, yeah. <laughs> and I like that, I like that. And then you got another caller who was, um, I think a young earth creationist, and they were talking about, and you got into a conversation, and this is actually tied into what the, the show question was about, is are humans apes? And mm -hmm. you had this conversation with this person where they said, well, no, in the Bible, God made man and then he made animals. Or I, I think in Genesis 2, it's the other way around. I can't remember. But anyway, they were made yeah. separately. And so in typical forest style, you went through, well, first of all, we're mammals. We got nipples. We got mammaries. Uh, and then went through a couple other things that defined us, defined us as apes. That, that's something you would say or do right now if I said humans aren't apes. That's what, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was going to start the show with, but we had to, we're on a time frame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. Right. But the problem I had, because this guy was saying, well, and this is where I think the contradiction comes from was that he was saying, uh, according to the Bible, humans are not animals. And then you said humans are animals, uh, according to biology. And the, and looking back at the prior thing, we said definitions of these things on the trans issue, we said definitions of these things are fuzzy and we're kind of making these boxes up. Um, because nature is fuzzy. Nature doesn't come with boxes. We make the boxes. Nature is fuzzy. So, but that's a definition that we're using. We're creating definitions. So one could say, like, you know, you've heard the tomato thing. Tomatoes are a fruit, but like uh, in a biological sense, but they're not a fruit in a culinary sense. Like if you make like a veggie terrine, you can put a tomato in there. You're not going to call it a fruit veggie terrine. So I think that someone, and this is kind of the main case I'm trying to put forward, is that someone who's like a biblical literalist can say by a biblical definition, humans are not apes. Okay, so you're, you're saying that you're, it sounds like your challenge to me is that because I put things like gender and species and everything else on the, the same playing field and by saying that, all of these are boxes that we as scientists draw around nature. We look at nature. Nature does what nature wants to do. We find patterns. We draw boxes around those patterns. Doesn't mean that the boxes are necessarily real. And that's why the boxes change from time to time. Those are all things that I say. Your argument is that then somebody can come back to me and say, well, because the boxes are arbitrary, I choose to draw them differently. And you can't say that I'm wrong. And in my choose choice of the boxes, I can say that trans people are invalid and that humans aren't apes or animals and, and blah, blah, blah. Is that, is that about what I'm getting? Uh, pretty close. I wouldn't push that trans people are invalid. You opened with it, so I didn't know if you, it was necessary that it, it be involved. <laughs> can I just point out that I, I well, really, I, like for the audience or yeah. anybody else, not that any, not like anybody is not aware, but if anyone isn't aware, what Forrest did just there is like really good in, in a dialectic. Say, it's, this is what you're saying, this is my view. That steel man's agree. I just Sorry, I just wanted to give kudos to that because that, it makes a conversation work so yeah. well. So I try, I yeah. try. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, I, I'll, I'll shut up now. I just, I that's, that's all I have to oh, offer no, right now. I appreciate that. No, that's very kind. I I would argue with it, it with that being the the challenge. I would argue um, specifically right. about the animals thing first. Um, that the box of ape is within the box of animal, and the box of animal is within the box of life. And so, like, it, there there has to be some fundamental reality that we can agree on. And there's a certain point where all of our boxes are going to be the same. Um, so you talk about, like, you know, animal versus plant versus fungus versus whatever. It comes down to cell type. Like, you, you look at their cells and you can tell the differences. And yet, there are plenty of living things that fall outside of that, that cannot be classified this way. That's why we have protists. 
We had, you know, the protista used to be a whole kingdom and then it kind of wasn't anymore. And now we have animal like protists and plant like protists and we have different. But at the end of the day, these are things that simply cannot be classified as plants or animals. They're just kind of fuzzy, weird in between gray areas that still exist and still matter and can still be tested and still have real ramifications in the world. That doesn't mean that the box of animal and plant and all these things aren't real. So if you're talking about humans being great apes, if you accept the fact that we, you know, J. Mike and I were talking about this just before the show. If you accept the fact that humans are mammals, you must therefore accept the fact that humans are animals because the mammal box is within the animal box. And so it, it's like saying, yes, this is a Subaru, but it's not a car. That doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? That you can't say that. And so, like, I'm still looking I'm, for those non animal, uh, non animal, right? Mammals. Yeah, so give me can, an example, you, email, of, you know, Jay yeah, an atheist, right. Right. yeah, no, and yes, and, that's the yeah, and, um, and it's the same thing if we talk about you know, with 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 gender. One of the challenges that I give to people who who claim that you know, sex and gender are the same thing and that they're strict binaries and that they fit in these little boxes is can you give me a definition of man or woman male or female let's say so let's say you know the popular one is woman that's the one that everybody likes to jump through so they can lump homophobia and sexism together into the diarrhea martini called trans oh, what is what is um, woman, huh? <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so no. let's go with that one can you give me a definition of woman that number one includes all cisgender women and all transgender men number two excludes all cisgendered men and all transgender women and number three is exclusively solely based on physical characteristics. You can't. There's, there isn't. Well, I've yet to hear one. A, 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 a solid definition of that that makes sex and gender the same thing and can actually properly define one against the other in a way that includes every single member of this group and excludes every single member of that group and is purely physical. It doesn't make any sense because. Sex is a multivariate system without a single determining factor, solely determining factor, and without a single factor that has uh, just two uh, uh, variables. And gender is a completely separate thing from sex, necessarily. Okay. So um, and so it's the same thing we talk about animals, we talk about species, we talk about what our taxonomy is. You know, when, when I said at the beginning of the show that we are apes and that's not a matter of opinion or worldview or whatever like that, um, you... What, that, the reason why I say that is because when you build the classification system for an ape, humans necessarily fall into that group. You don't have to try to put humans into the ape group. When you classify an ape, you end up with a human too. And there was a long time we tried to not do that. When we tried to say, like, humans are this other, we, we made man the tool maker, always only man, the tool maker, right? And then Jane Goodall went out and found chimpanzees making tools. And uh, Leakey uh, famously said, well, we either need to redefine tool, redefine man, or accept the chimpanzees are humans. And so, like, that's the thing, man. Every single time throughout history that we've tried to set ourselves apart, it hasn't worked. When you use the classification oh, okay. system that we have, it, it, it works as well. And you could argue the classification system is broken, but that is a very, very, very expensive thing to say because you now need to find a way to restructure a classification system in a way that works like with what you're saying specifically. And I guarantee you can't do that. You know what I mean? Well, no, I can. I can. Very simply. Um, Go for it. So when you, because you I said, feel like this said, isn't going to be the simple. When we build, I'm oh, sorry, Jay Mike, were you saying something? Oh, no, no, sorry. Ignore me. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. So when you said, when we build the classification of an ape, and that's a really important comment here. That's a really important statement. And that's what I'm pushing back against a little bit, is that we decide what counts as an ape. Or not, when I say we, actually, I want to break it down a little bit, because we sounds like it's including everyone. We includes biologists. I think... Uh, the FDA. the FDA. Do you know what the FDA classifies bee honey as? It classifies it as raw meat. As a biologist, do you think honey is raw meat? 
No, but I also think that's a bad analogy because the FDA is a political organization and their motivations are necessarily economic and political. It's the same reason why uh, vegetable or uh, 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 because you brought up tomatoes earlier, tomatoes are taxed differently because they're culinarily vegetables, even though they're biologically fruit. So like biology is not going to be hindered by those same issues. It has been in the past and a big part of biology over the past really two centuries has been to undo that and to say, all right, these were us, you know, these classification systems here were us applying our literally Victorian standards on the rest of the universe. Turns out that doesn't work. Let's let nature tell the story about nature. And that's what biology has been. I mean, um, earlier, I started with the util utilitarian argument for why in a culinary field, uh, tomatoes are considered vegetables. Uh, even though they're classified as fruits biologically, it's because from a utilitarian perspective, it makes more sense uh, that if you're a if you're in the kitchen culinarily, it makes more sense to call a tomato a vegetable. If you make a dish that you says is only vegetables, has a tomato in it, no one's going to call you out on that. Um, and you're not going to Except there are some fruits salad. that aren't sweet and that you would totally put with vegetables. And there are some vegetables that are sweet and you would totally put with fruit. Like it's, uh, it's exactly. the, 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 the long biology, and short of it is you're talking about an arbitrary exactly. classification system by using an arbitrary classification system. And you're trying to say, well, humans do these weird things. It's like, yeah. What? It's also arbitrary. And I'm by, sure but, you, can make, you can add one more arbitrary classification system, which is biblical, which is that humans are separate from animals. And that's part of the thing is you can make a arbitrary you, because if we can agree that the biological classification of things, because you did say we created it, um, if that is fundamentally arbitrary, then a biblical definition of whales as fish. I mean, you know, the fish definition is already a weird one anyway, but um, excluding humans from animals uh, I mean, which we do colloquially anyway, uh, is another arbitrary definition that a that a Christian or whoever could have that is valid in the sense that so long as they're not saying in a biological sense humans are not animals, still makes sense in the framework of biblically humans are not animals. Because like if you want to hammer down super hard on the biology thing, like that's inconsistent with your take on trans people. Are, are you still there? I, I I don't know if I'm sorry. Did I cut out? I think. Oh, I, okay. Have sorry. I there's no. You're there. There's a little issue on my screen as well. So apologies. We'll get Forrest. Um, uh, we'll get Forrest. I'm not hearing back. Forrest either, and I, and I thought I would hear for, hear Forrest at this. No, point. it's Forrest. Forrest well, is about to be back. back. No, you're good. Forrest is back. I, I I thought it was me, so we were both kind of going through this. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh. oh I'm sorry. Uh, maybe maybe that's on my end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really no quick. Worries. See, Mike, uh, earlier I. I've seen you a few times on the show. Did you say you were a Christian earlier, or did I mishear you? I've never been a Christian. Uh, okay. I I think you said in the example you're presenting as a Christian, and that's what I probably heard. Yeah, no, I, I, I All right. you know, we go to church cha church camps and stuff like that with friends. And uh, so, I mean, there might have been a time where, like, I was thinking about this actually, like, a couple days ago, where I was like, well, like you guess you could make an argument that there was a time I believed in God, but I don't really take being a kid and having like an attitude towards a proposition no, no, the same no. way that when you're older, because like you're kind of taking anything you can get. And if you just hear something, it's almost like you can just formulate, you know, just a belief on that thing. And so, yeah, so I wasn't I wasn't what would you, you know, what people really mean by when they say they believe in God. Not only am I back, but my okay. quality is significantly better. At yeah, least you on my end. That one, it looks way better went, than it was. You went off and got your, you get makeup. That's what happened. Got my glow up. Yeah. I, anyway, Mike, I, uh, yeah, long story short from what I'm hearing is that like anybody can apply any arbitrary thing. I would argue that science has gotten significantly less arbitrary, especially biology uh, over the past couple of centuries. Um, we've been doing a really good job of dismantling old constructs and reapplying 
you know, looking at nature and letting nature tell the story. And so while I would maintain that, yes, our whole job is to draw boxes around patterns. And the, the reason why I say that is because sometimes those boxes change because we discover new data. That doesn't mean that the boxes are flippant or that they're, they're pointless. It means that we haven't discovered any new data that would make us change the boxes yet. What's important to remember is that you never accept a hypothesis. You fail to reject one. You're always trying to look for a reason to change. You're always trying to reason to prove yourself wrong. And when you can't find one, you cannot prove yourself wrong anymore. That is when you move forward with the proposition. And so when we talk about redrawing the boxes and things like that, all I mean to say is that we found new data. We proved ourselves wrong. We changed our worldview. We changed the way that we see the things around us. That hasn't happened yet in terms of the classification of humans or the you know gender or whatever other you want to point to. We have new data that has made us think about these things the way that we have now. It's not impossible that something new would come up later and change our mind, but you don't get to bank on that possibility as a foundation for what you believe now. That's what crazy people do. And so as it is at this moment, uh, not just based on our classification system, based on the available data at hand, humans are absolutely apes. Humans are absolutely primates. Humans are absolutely mammals. Humans are absolutely animals. And also sex and gender are different things and all the other stuff. Like that's all, th that is all based on the available data. Um, and that's why it's accepted by the scientific community at large. So it's, I wouldn't right, argue that it's arbitrary out. in terms of like something that you could throw out at any given moment or that it's comparable to the arbitrariness of using the Bible. A couple of things I just want to say, first off, trans sure. rights are human rights. Like I'm, you know, big up on that. But Hard agree. the thing about the animals and about classifications is that what I'm trying to draw a distinction between, I'm not trying to argue that within biology, humans are not apes. But I'm saying that a, another substantial group with a different set of criterion could create you're, a... You're playing devil's advocate. I, I understand that. I get that. What I'm, what I'm saying is that I understand that you're playing the devil's advocate. However, two things being arbitrary doesn't mean that they're arbitrary in the same way. And the word arbitrary doesn't always mean something you can just ignore and throw out and change and it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it, it's like you know saying like the drinking age being 21. That's an arbitrary ass number to pick that, but it is way closer to your brain being further developed than like seven. And so we can't just say it's an arbitrary number. Therefore, it's just the same as saying we can drink at seven. It doesn't really matter because they're all arbitrary numbers. There actually is a reason to stick to that number may not be the best number, but it's a fuckload better than seven. And so it's the same thing with this. When we talk about, you know, our classification systems of animals. Yeah, at the end of the day, it is a human-built classification system that you can criticize and should criticize. And that's the point of systematics and science. The field of systematics is criticizing that classification system and coming up with better classifications. But what you don't get to say is, well, you have this arbitrary classification and I have this arbitrary classification and they're the same thing because they're both arbitrary. That that doesn't make any sense. So again, I understand that you're, you're playing devil's advocate, but my pushback to that would be one of those is still based in reality and the other one is still silly. And what that doesn't mean that the one based in reality can't be improved, but it can't be improved by being made more silly. Consider the legal system and its definition of humans and animals. The legal I don't think we need to. Not arbitrary at all. You agree that the legal system is not arbitrary in its definition of what is an animal and what is a person. No. Right. So under a different criterion, we can say, like, legally, people are not animals. Legally. Right, but that's, sort of law, that's but why I say, that's why I would say, that's, that's why when I talk about other animals, I say things like other animals or non-human animals. When you go to a, a primatologist or, or an anthropologist or a biomedical scientist or whatever, anybody who studies humans, they're going to talk about non-human primates. They're not just going to say primates because that would include humans. I like I work with people who study this at this very moment. I, I, I literally one of the people who is working in the same lab that I'm working in has an anthropology background and is now doing biomed, and he studies non-human primates, and that is the language that he uses: non-human primates. Because if he just said primates, he would also be talking about humans. 
He doesn't consider the legal definition or the biblical definition or the anything. He's talking about science because he's a scientist doing science. And so like when we're speaking about reality, we can use real terms. If I'm going to talk about other animals, I'm usually going to say the term other animals. If I'm speaking colloquially, I might just say animals because we in, in common parlance make a distinction, but that doesn't change my or anyone else's classification system. Uh, nor should it stand as a criticism for my or anybody else's classification system. So, Forrest, did Our my friend doesn't use part? keep creeping thing as a as a uh... yeah exactly. I, I don't <laughs> I don't count creeping thing in my taxonomy. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, that's 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 yeah. It's if if someone was going to try to use biblical classification, we would have a million problems. Like how you know insects, how you classify them, or how you classify birds. Are bats birds or not? Because the Bible says they are. I, and so I, like. I, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, it's, it's <laughs> as as I said a little while ago. If you really want to try to say, you know, this is my classification system based on the Bible, okay, that is a very expensive thing to say. That's not a difference of opinion. That is a very expensive thing that you now have to back up with a lot of changes to everything you say about everything else. Yeah, imagine science uh, classified something as creeping thing. I mean, like yeah. creation well, of people wouldn't shut up. Does, wouldn't that, shut does up that include, it. yeah, exactly. Does that include grasshoppers? They're jumping things. Does that include yeah. my neighbor? He's pretty creepy. Does that, you know, what is that? <laughs> yeah, it's just, anyway, we've, we've been going for about 27 minutes and we've got two other calls left and we've still got, you know, we're already 30 minutes over time, but is there anything else you wanted to add there, Mike? There, there's just uh, one last question just for, for, for J. Mike there, as cause I, I don't get a chance to talk to philosopher much, but... Um, I, I won't call well, myself a philosopher think... ever, so just pointing that out. Well, I, I, I'm <laughs> going like, to have to get used to it. Uh, uh, it's so it's kind of crazy can, to me. Is, can something have uh, free will? Like, can you, can you envision a being that isn't... Uh, affected by determinism or is the my kind of posit here is free will is an error of language uh can you envision a being with free will that is not affected by determin determinism or randomness um are you are you asking me like what my what my view is yeah yeah can something have free will and what does that mean well, that depends. Like, uh, if we're talking about libertarian free will, no, I don't see that as an option. Um, you know, I have some friends and whatnot that give some pushback on it. So, you know, maybe the assessment's not correct or something, which is fine. Uh, but the way that I look at possibility or modality or um, being able to do otherwise or um, anything like that is, <clears throat> is a question about if the antecedents are fixed. Like, if we fix those... Uh, I have an issue with explanatory difference, uh, like an explanatory difference principle. And what I mean there is like, if I, if we fix all the facts, like Forrest, you know, makes a sandwich and gets all the, the bread out and the mayonnaise, right. And he's about to eat it. Um, yeah. I don't like mayonnaise, mayonnaise either. Yeah. I just said that in case Katie was watching. I'm with you guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, but it, if we fix all those facts and we say that like in one case, like he eats the sandwich and then in another case, like it could, you could hold those same antecedents fixed and he could just decide not to eat it. Uh, there needs to be some explanatory difference between those two worlds. And what that's going to amount to in my aspect is some other, some difference in the antecedents, which prompts the difference in the subsequent uh, outcome. But determinism, so, you can't have a difference in the antecedents. Well, I'm just saying if we're supposing that we say, like, why did um, Forrest eat the sandwich rather than not eat or you know, what is there an explanation for why Forrest ate the sandwich as opposed to no explanation? That's going to be a true dichotomy. And if it turns out to be an explanation, then what I'm looking for is an ex explanation on uh, like why he ate the sandwich. And if we can use the exact same ex explanation uh, to appeal to him not eating the sandwich. And I'm saying you can't do that because... Uh, there's an explanatory difference. There's different antecedents that are going to prompt uh, a different outcome. And so the free will isn't even an option in that case, right? It's not even part of like, 
in my view. It's not even part of the dichotomy. The only way that you could get a different option in my view is if there's like something indeterminate or random because like you can imagine that we're um, equal free will because then no, no, I I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. You would collapse your intentions into like, I mean, cause like, presumably you don't want free will being a species of indeterminism like that would be very strange to me i mean maybe maybe someone can make an argument for that and they want to they want to nest it in in that realm or whatever but for me the way that i'm looking at it's like if you imagine we just had a uh you know it's a play-doh factory is an example that's given um and we're pumping out red play-doh all the time uh and we know that no one came in overnight and put blue dye in the machine and me and forrest at the red division you know of the of the dough factory or whatever um we see blue Play-Doh uh, uh, pump out of the machine and all the antecedents are the same. The machine's the exact same. Everything is the, the exact same way, but blue comes up. The only way you could have such an explanatory difference uh, without it being determined is if it was random. If it just, at some point there was an indeterminate link between like the machine and like the effects that it produces or whatever. And that would explain blue or it would, in a sense, right? It's like kind of like rolling a quantum die. It's like, well, yeah, it, right. we yeah. don't. We well, can't explain why it, it rolled six over random. three, but it was random. Yeah, and neither, so free will doesn't exist of in either of those cases. But I would call myself a compatibilist in the sense that, or I lean towards compatibilism. I'll say, and that I the way that I want to use free will is is different than a, a libertarian notion. So, right, right, and that's and that's I think that's all I was trying to kind of do because I think my view of this with a little bit of background in linguistics, it's like free will is just a term used wrongly. Like we, like free will means what we experience is free will, not, but philosophically, you know, we can't exactly show that we have it. So if, I think when people say we have no free will, I think there, there's two versions of the term and they're using one over the other. But anyway, I appreciate your guys' yeah. time. Uh, no problem. Uh, I, I do want. I, I do want to add just real quick. I don't think that the concept sure, sure. we're tracking with free will on the compatibilist thing is people going like, "Oh, if you were around, rewinded the clock, I could have done this other thing." Like, I don't think that that's what people really no, mean. I think what they're. Too. I think yeah. I think that the concept that we're actually tracking, and I know there might be a lot of people that disagree with me, is something acting as in according with your desires and what you want, some like a normative kind of accordance relation or something um and it wouldn't matter to me whether or not i was like determined to vote you know for candidate a or whatever you know if someone came up in the machine and planked and got in my head and you know just you know try to get me the krabby patty formula or something or get me to vote for candidate b uh that's going to go against the desires that i had and i think that when we talk about free will in the context there i think most people are tracking that concept that's going to involve a giant analysis i can't sum it up in this you know last little few sentences but um there's debate on that and i i enjoy that topic but it's definitely not something that i like go out of my way it's i i can take it or leave it with determinism or compatibilism i could wake up tomorrow fully determinist not compatibilist i wouldn't it doesn't matter to me and with that uh mike we're gonna jump on to the next call but thank you so much for being here man feel free to call back anytime All right, so we've got two calls left. We're already 30 minutes over time. <laughs> we've got two calls left. Um, so we're going to uh, blow through these as fast as we can. There's one in particular that I'm interested in uh, hearing out. And I know you, Mike, said you have a hard cut here in a minute anyway. So like we're, and I probably do too, if I'm being honest with myself. I yeah, I should probably be done. <laughs> I've, got, I've got so much going on today. Um, but really quick, before we move on, have you ever thought to yourself, I love the ACA content and all the things that the ACA creates. And I wish that there is a way that I could get it all the time. We've all been there. And boy, have we got you covered. We now have two, count them, two 24-hour live streams. AXP TV delivers a constant stream of shows, clips, and specials over all 26 seasons of the Atheist Experience. And now Heathen TV provides you with clips from Talk Heathen as well. Uh, watch or just listen to your favorite hosts and discover some new hosts you've never even heard of. Visit tiny.cc slash AXP TV and tiny.cc slash Heathen TV to join into the fun. And with that, uh, we're going to read some super chats and then we're going to do the last uh maybe one call maybe two calls depending on how this goes um mm-hmm. we've got sean isherwood sent another two dollars look up disjunction uh sorry they're called disjunctive numbers look them up um super chat from halo master 2143 two canadian dollars round and round the circular arguments go 
Andrew Sword, $6.66. Atheist Community of America win. That sounds like, like a Justice League of America, like the Atheist Community of America. Sounds pretty tight. Um, and then a bunch, a bunch of things telling me that my camera's bad and I need to refresh. Halo Master 2143 again. Got five Canadian dollars. If I ever have kids, I hope to, every fiber of my being to hear, hope them sing a Valkai the Science Guy theme song. Valkai the science guy does rhyme. I'm just saying. After school, that would be fantastic. Um, and then we've got Megan Marie sent four dollars and ninety nine cents. Amer uh, uh, those are American four dollars and ninety nine cents. So you know they're real and valuable, not like the Canadian ones. Uh, Forrest and J. Mike, what a great uh, matchup! Great show tonight. Thank you so much. Thank That's you. all very very kind of you. Um, with that, we're going to jump into uh, possibly the last call. We'll see. This is James, pronoun he, him, who's calling in from California, wants to explain why God does not intervene. James, you're on AXB. Thank you so much for waiting for so long. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. Yeah, I just was listening um, earlier, and I wanted to um, give the explanation of why God doesn't um, you know, intervene in everything. For example, when you know, something bad is happening because, um, he is going to, his judgment is going to happen, but right now he's being patient. And I know that it seems to us how cruel, how unfair, but if he did intervene right now, then he would have to punish all of us that have have been immoral in any way. So really, really quick before, before we go on any further, James, I just want to ask you where you, you, you said you were calling in because we were talking about this earlier. So I just want to reiterate very quickly, you heard us come to the conclusions and I want to ask if you agree with these conclusions to be clear what I'm doing here. We came to the conclusion that it is possible for everybody to know for sure that God is real and not violate their free will. It is possible for everybody to make only good decisions and never ever sin while also still having free will. It's logically possible that God made a world like that and he chose not to. We also talked about how God doesn't intervene uh, because, uh, it, it, and even though intervening could also still keep our free will. So I know that's not what you've talked about yet. I just want to make sure so we don't have to rehash all of that. Do you agree with all those premises right. that okay. it is absolutely possible no. that God no, does intervene and makes everybody believe in him without changing free will? And is that are we on board with that? And if not, which premise that. do you this is why. which which premise do you this say why but tell, well, okay, tell us uh, which, biblical, tell us which the, premise you specifically deny so that way we under, we understand what you're referring to? Yeah. Um it's not we do not have free will. When it comes to being moral, perfectly moral, we do not have that. It's impossible. Well, that makes, for us to be that makes the moral. argument that makes the argument really? easier. Then God could yeah, just determine the outcomes. Well, that this way. is <laughs> this is this is this is why. So, because this, you know, immorality came into the world through Adam and Eve, according to the story, um, because of that, those two people who were immoral had children who then were immoral. Because that entered into everything that we know, everything we see, the world, everything in it, people, everything, every single thing is not perfect. It's not the way God created it. None of it is. Nothing is. God didn't make us this way. We became this way through sin. So we're looking at the world and everything in it as these amazing things, and we don't even understand it all. But it's all imperfect. This, this, isn't, this isn't an objection. In the, argument, in the argument I gave, right, so let me ask you the same thing. Right. Do you think that when you yeah. sinned, that you freely could have not sinned the last time that you sinned? No, I do not. I do not agree with that. We cannot help ourselves. We try. Okay, we so, make okay, so then, so then, the so then, so then it's determined then, right? It's not determined. It's the fact okay, that so, it's part of us. We, it's okay, part so of us. It's, it's either it's, de- look, it's either it's determined or it isn't, but point point being let's go back let's just go let's just start it because i'm sure force wants to go here right? yeah yeah let's go yes. let's go let's go back to adam and eve then did they have the free will did, did they have knowledge of good or evil where where are you there they have the ability to make a choice yes but they didn't understand what the choice would okay. end up being so, afterwards so they, god can create said, any logically possible them, state, on, god can create any logically possible he, state of affairs and now this is even easier of an argument because now i just need mm-hmm. one element in the set just one element in the set not even the whole set i just need one element in the whole set adam and eve freely could uh freely could have chose the good god is a being that can instantiate any logically possible state of affairs it's logically possible that they choose the right choice right 
No, you just said not it's logically possible. Oh, it's not. Like, what's the contradiction? The right what's, con- what's the contradiction of them choosing the, the right choice? Just, just what, the, are, what is just the proposition the and the its negation they're, entailed they're, by them making the right choice? That's what a contradiction is. Okay, just a moment. The reason that they made the wrong choice was that they were tempted or lured into something, believing it was going to benefit them. Do you understand? You just, just like we are. Even today, we are. That you just right? said that we you, we believe that we. Well, what do you mean? We yeah, believe so, we make choices look, based on what's going to benefit us, look, right? Look, just, and so we're lured into things, and sometimes track, we realize track, after track the fact. Me, track, track with me. Track with me. When we. <laughs> You said it's either the case that they they have libertarian free will, yes or no. They can choose either they can choose evil or not, right? Or choose the good. True or false? Well, they have the ability to choose. Adam and Eve had the ability to choose to to make decisions. That was that was such a short answer that had like, come on. True or false? Do they have free will? Their decision was to obey or not obey. That was true or false? To obey or not obey. That's true or false. I'm just gonna say true or false. Say it again. Say Say the statement again. Yeah, so you weren't listening. Great. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad that I interrupted. Then, so yeah. Hold on. They have free, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve have free will, and this time, listen to me. True or false? You have to explain what what type of free will. What was the free will? They could have look at the exact point they chose evil. They could have chose good, right? Yes or no? You mean they? Ch- you will say say it they in this. They could way. have freely chosen they chose to, to do disobey, the good. Wait, wait, wait. Yes or no? At the point they chose to disobey, they could have chosen to obey. Yes, I agree I, with that. I'm, okay, there he said it. I was, I was going to say I'm going to mute you until you give me a fucking answer. <laughs> Jesus. Go ahead, Mike. Go since ahead. he he gave you the answer. So okay, so they can freely choose good. All right, great. God, that's and yeah. that's so logically possible for them to choose good we've accepted that it's great it's metaphysically possible for them to choose good yeah. great god is a being that can instantiate any logically possible state of affairs yes or no clarify the statement for me god is a being that can instantiate any possible state of affairs that doesn't contain a contradiction so like he can so he he's can not create gonna, not, any type of world he wants well, I'm not talking about like a burrito so hot he can't eat it or something like that. I'm talking about anything in the realm of it being logically possible, right? I'm not saying he can create married bachelors or square okay. right? Like yeah, so agreed. He can agreed. do all. Yes. Okay, great, great. So then the conclusion follows, right? God can make a world such that Adam and Eve selects for the. He only has two worlds to select from, right? <laughs> really? Or, or th- three if they just decide to like. Uh, no, two. They either they either eat from the fruit or they don't, right? So. Mm-hmm. That he knows, he pulls the file cabinet. Now this is even easier. Instead of having this giant list of all the free actions of all these other agents, I just have this file agent that yeah. says Adam and Eve, right? So there's two files that I look at and I can see all of their possible options of what they can do. And in the world where yeah. they do the evil, I know that ahead of time. In the world where they do the good, I know that ahead of a time ahead of time. And if my desire is for everybody to freely do good, and I'm a rational agent, it seems very clear what the rational choice for me to do. Right. So it just sounds like what you're stating is you mm-hmm. believe in a God that's irrational and that fails with respect to his desires. If he desires such a world. Now, the no, next question no, is, is, does he, he desire desires. that world? This I'm sorry. Desires. You come on. You come, you come on in. Real quick. I don't want to hog all this. Then you're fine. I'll, I'll let him answer. And then I'll I'll I've got some things. Just a couple. Okay. In just a couple sentences, I'll explain it to you. This is the world he desired. He desired and knew ahead of time that people would fail. And that they would be in immorality. They would be living in morality. Every single person ever born after Adam and Eve. He knew that. So he predestined for the, a way out of that immorality or the penalty of that immorality, which is death. He predestined a way out, which was for those people to humble themselves, admit their You're guilt, just and ask him to forgive them. That's that's no no no. This is this is the exact. You're just a tool. You're just a tool for the end. end. Then you're just you're just a tool for the end, right? You're just a mechanism. Not a tool. No no no. Yes, it's it's no different. No, look, it's no different than me pressing a button on the computer. The end result that I want is the the screen to come on. You are just like the inner working of the computer. No, because this is what he's going to get. This is what he's going to get out of it. This is what he's going to get out of it. He's going to get people who either humble themselves and admit their guilt and ask for forgiveness and try. 
right, and come to him for that forgiveness. Or he's going to get people who recognize their guilt or their immorality, and they're going to deny him and push him away and shun him. Those are the weak and the tears. He's He's letting them all grow up together. This is what's happening. We're all growing up together. We live together. Some of us are shunning him, and others are admitting that we're guilty. We're humble ourselves, and we come to him and say, forgive me. I I put you on mute. I typically don't do this, but how in the hell is this an objection to anything that we've said at all? This is is just your, your preaching, and you're just saying terrible, terrible things. Like, what an asshole. If anything you're saying is true, what an asshole this God is. I, 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 I'm sorry, you haven't addressed anything that J. Mike said. I have a few, a, a list of notes here about everything you've been saying that I would like to address. But yes, like, sir. just well, let's bring him back. Let's make sure he can, he, is he unmuted yet? Oh, he's unmuted. Yeah, he's unmuted. Okay. Just, like, what you're saying at this point here, uh, James, I just want to make sure that you're, you're understanding is like, yeah, well, well, God made the world this way because he wants these things to happen. He wants us to do bad things. He wanted no, Adam and Eve to He doesn't to want them to happen. No. That's, then that's insane then that's insane, James. Because what Jay might just explain to you was that God logically could have made a world where Adam and Eve didn't sin. And you said, but he wanted it to happen that way. And if you're backtracking on that now, who it's cares? It's not that he wanted it. No, it's not that he wanted it. You're he, saying he I'm not, hold on. I'm not, I'm not going to let you reason. preach again. I'm not going to let you preach again. The fact of the matter is, all blame ultimately falls back on God here. No matter how you slice it, if there is evil in the world, it's God's fault. That is all that there is to it. It's God's decision to make it. It's God's decision to allow it. And it ultimately falls back on him. If Adam and Eve didn't know the difference between right and wrong, and they made the wrong decision, you can't blame them for it. God knows the outcome of everything. If he knew something bad was going to happen and allowed it to happen anyway, he can't blame them for it. He knew it was going to happen, and he didn't intervene. You said Adam and Eve were tempted in the garden. Who put the serpent in the garden? Who made the garden that way? Who allowed the tree that they shouldn't touch to be in the middle of the garden? Who's the one who made all of the circumstances of temptation? God made all of these circumstances on purpose, knowing what was going to happen, and still stuck with that situation, and then decided to punish and blame everybody else for his stupid decision making. It's like if I walked up to a paraplegic person and said, stand up and walk or I'll beat your ass. It's not their fault if they don't walk. I can't punish them for doing the thing that they can't do. Right. I can't punish them for right. not doing something but if you, they're on it. So if you're saying, yeah, well, uh, God knows everything that happens. God made the world this way on purpose. God knows what's going to come next. And then when it happens, it's our fault. That makes God a monster. Do you understand that? It, it, the, the example that I gave last time was a way if to, walk, I, to not be a paraplegic. If, That's what he's, doing. he's like he's offering you a way that you can walk. And not be a paraplegic. He's, he That's is he's absolutely you know not. You Based on what you just said, he is not. J. Mike asked at the beginning, is it possible that nobody sins, that we all make the correct choice? And you said no. You said that it is in our nature to sin, that we have to sin. Who made us that way? God. A way he to made make it happen that. that way. It doesn't matter if you change it. Again, the way the example I gave at the beginning, the last time we brought this up, was if I get in my car and I see on the fuel gauge that I have 10 miles of fuel left, and then I try to drive 100 miles and I run out of gas, I can't blame the car. And I can't say, well, we drove past a gas station and the car didn't turn in there. It's inevitably falling back on me that I knew what was going to happen and I made the decision anyway. It's not the car's fault. It's my fault. If God knows the future, if God knows what's going to happen, if God knows all things and then people sin and turn against him and all these things, then either he wants it to be that way or he's a moron and he just let it happen and was surprised that the thing that he knew was going to happen happened. And if he isn't stupid, then he's evil because it means that he then made these people knowing that they were going to rebel against him knowing that they were going to live in sin and die in sin, and he made them anyway, which means he made those people in order for them to go to hell. Hell must have been the purpose, the intention, 
at the end of it. And that is monstrous. There is no way you can slice this given your parameters or really any parameters, given that God is all knowing, all knowing and all powerful to say that God is not either stupid or evil it's or like both. thinking the guy that throws the grenade such that it creates a hero to jump on top of it. Exactly. Right? Like, oh, well, we wouldn't have, you know, like it's it, the, the circumstances of the grenade being, th uh, the grenade being thrown is, uh, direct is not something that you turn back and go well we wouldn't have had the, a hero right the same thing with like oh it's really good that a bunch of people were oppressed and we had to you know mm -hmm. have a civil rights movement but it's really because then we have Martin now, Luther King. yeah yes. because then, then now we have these it would be a better world if we didn't have to have had certain yes. people fighting for these rights we should have just been equal from the start right and so exactly it turns out that what your view is is something like well you know civil rights movement or something or grenade throwing or whatever creates this suffering that allows for this triumph at the end. All you're saying is all things considered, right? There's no evil in the view because that evil is what's required. It's like having a cook and I'm, I'm baking something for, for Forrest. And I'm just like, Oh, well I made this lasagna and I used this, uh, this evil salt. And you're like, why did you use the evil salt? And I'm like, well, I couldn't get the best tasting lasagna unless I used the evil salt. Like all the other <laughs> lasagnas will not taste good without the evil salt. And then Forrest eats it. He goes, damn, this, this is fucking good lasagna. Why are you calling it evil salt? Isn't that like a good thing? And, and like, yeah, it just turns out that that's a good thing. And so now we have this immense consequence, all things considered, like the Holocaust mm -hmm. should have occurred. All things considered, babies being punched in the face today should have occurred, right? You have this immense right. consequence that the evil, the thing that quote unquote, ought not be done turns out to be the thing that ought be done or else there is no greater good it's the crucial element for the plan to be successful there's no evil in your worldview and by the way if there's no evil in your worldview if there's nothing that ought not be done in your worldview and sin is supposed to be something that ought not be done well then there's no sin in your worldview if there's mm -hmm. no there's, it just turns out that you're just making these like really weird claims and calling them sin if there's no sin in your worldview there's no original sin if there's no original sin then jesus's atonement is vacuous and if jesus's atonement is vacuous then christianity is false so i don't think that that is the, bur the bullet you want to bite where it turns out that there's nothing that ought not be done because sin becomes vacuous and jesus's death is meaningless like, like I said a minute ago, man, there's no yeah. way you can possibly slice this where God is neither stupid, evil, or both. Am I muted? No, you're not. Am I muted? No. You can okay. cut in at any so time. I, I'm, I don't agree with, well, I don't agree with what you were saying regarding no sin and the Christ's death was pointless. But here's the thing. I can't blame you for something I did. I'm not going to blame you for my, my wrongdoings. And you can't blame me for your wrongdoings. We are all accountable for our own things, right? So, so you're blaming God for something a person did, people did. How, how can you blame someone else for something that someone else did? You just yeah. said it was that part of his no plan. Did you not? you did just you, a minute ago said that it was no, part of the plan. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, I didn't say... Stop, stop. Bro, bro, I didn't you say are part of the plan. I said he knew, he knew it would happen. He, it's like this. If you have a child, you know that they're going to do bad things and get in trouble. You're going to punish them, right? You know it's going to happen. So should you not have a child if you want one? You, you want it a child. It depends. Is he stealing him. candy from the corner him. store or raping someone? Because, yeah, I could intervene in okay. one or the other, and it would mean different things, right? Like, the, the it really boils right. down to this, James. Right. Does anything ever happen that goes against God's will? Is God all-powerful or not? Yes. Millions of things happen that yeah, go and against an all powerful, God's will. An all Millions powerful parent could have created the child, right? He's waiting. He's he's right. waiting. So you're just, you're, he's you're waiting. waiting. So is God all powerful? Is he there anything that God can't do? Him, watch. Can you? Answer I'm going to ask question. again. Is, is God do? all powerful? Is there okay. anything that God can't no, there do? Are things he can't do. Yes, there's things he cannot do. Yes. Like what? There are. Like what? He can't sin. He can't lie. He can't lie and he can't sin. That's he can't so. Be first of all, the lying thing isn't true. He's, he he does that do several times in the Bible. Wait, 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 but hold on. He can't he, sin and he lied. can't lie, but he's a free agent. So now it just turns out you can have no options for evil at all. Turn out to be an agent and have free will. If you hold to a view where God Himself imbues the properties where He can't do evil or sin, and He's just going by His nature, 
then he can create agents that can just choose between competing goods. God could just make his nature reflective of bunny rabbits and, and rainbows. And I go, oh, I can go sit under the I rainbow can, today. Or I, I can, can go have a bunch of, rabbit. I can right? have, that's the choice right. that I can have. Right. And so if you right. just hold I that could, view, oh my God. For, ugh, force, man, I'm sorry. I can't, <laughs> no, I can't, just, I can't, I can't. There's the, you, you keep painting yourself into a smaller and weirder corner here, oh. James. God can't sin and God can't lie. First of all, that's not true. He says so himself in the Bible. But we'll, that's the whole of the debate that we'll have for 45 minutes. We've already been on this call for 20 minutes, and we've got another one, and we have five minutes left in the show. Um, the, 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 but the whole thing, if God can control anything in the world, if God could have made any world that he wants, and this is the one that he chose— he is inevitably at fault for all of it. You say, oh, well, if you're a parent, you can do blah, 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 blue. Like, if you're a parent, you can raise your kids better. You don't just set them free and, oh, well, I guess they raped somebody. I'll punish them later. Like, that doesn't make any sense. If if this is all part of the plan, I guess this is the question, is, is all of the sin and bad things that happen in the world part of God's plan? Because what you've said a few times is that God doesn't want to make slaves and robots. He wants us all to come to him freely and admit that we're sinful and everything. So then that logically follows. It seems that you're saying that all the sin and evil and bad shit that humans do in the world is a necessary part of God's overall plan of people coming to him and loving him and all this stuff. Is that is that where we're at? Like, am I understanding that at least? It's not necessary. It is happening. By people so then he could have done it otherwise, and he didn't. So it falls right back to what I was saying a minute ago. Sin isn't necessary. He just chose it on purpose. He didn't have to have a world where 25 to 30,000 people starve to death every single day. A thousand people an hour starve to death right now. That's a real statistic. God didn't need that world, but he was like, you know, it would be really fucking cool if a bunch of these stupid apes that I made starve to death. If they all died in one of the most painful ways possible for no reason at all, and then also most of them that do so will be praying to the wrong God when they do it, so I get to burn them forever. That would be swell. That's the God you're giving us here, is it's a God a that didn't have to make no. sin, didn't no. have to make disease, didn't right. have to make slavery, didn't have to make pain, but he said, you know what would be really fucking cool is if all that evil shit existed, and then he made it. Yeah, it's 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 just wrong, to express. Wrong. It's just to express to be an. Then whence agent. cometh evil, James? If God didn't make sin, then where does it come from? If sin isn't necessary, then why is there pain and suffering and disease and slavery and starvation in the world? Why is it here? Why? Yeah. Why does it? Exist? Why is there bad things? Why? Why do people starve to death? Why do kids get cancer? Why? Why is AIDS a thing? I'll tell you why. Just a moment, because people make decisions based on their own desires. What and decision example, did somebody not, made? Wait, Stop. Wait, no, wait, I'm not wait, letting you finish wait, that sentence, bro. Wait. I am not letting you finish that sentence. What decision did somebody make that led to pediatric cancer? Oh, that that's the sinful nature that the entropy entered into the world. Everything's dying in different ways. What we the all die. For fuck's sake. Fuck and you? we're you right are, back at the beginning where God Jewish didn't reality. need sin. We're right back to where we were 10 minutes ago where we said, did God need to make sin? And you said, no, sin isn't necessary. God could have made a world where Adam and Eve didn't sin, but he wanted people to come to himself willingly. We're back in a loop where we put the blame back on God. If cancer is caused by sin, which that's fucking disgusting to say in the first place, but if cancer is caused by sin and our sinful nature of entropy and all this shit, couldn't God have made a world where that doesn't exist and all of his needs are still met? Yeah, you're literally saying like God couldn't have gone, okay, baby cancer. Maybe I can cross that one off yeah, the list. Yeah, ba baby cancer or no maybe baby cancer. I'm going to go with list. baby cancer. Baby cancer is the way I want to do it. What a dick! Like, why is that who you're worshiping? To give them eternal life, God has the power to give those babies eternal life in the new world on the new earth. So, so here, here's the crux of the issue. Here's that's that's the part you're missing. So then, are you willing to say, James? Perfectly. Are you willing to say if 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 this life doesn't matter and we have the power, God has the power to give us eternal life. Everything matters. Everything matters. Okay, so those those babies dying of cancer. 
Not that big of a deal they because matter. they get eternity in heaven, right? No, it's not a, a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a huge deal, but God will correct it. He has the power to do that. Yeah, this is that what you said. Of, that's what you said. When though, everything will be corrected perfectly. Bullshit. No, no, stop. This is what you said with this bullshit because your whole thing is like you came in, this is why God doesn't intervene. And uh, that, that's what the call screener has. You came in, you said the same thing is that he'll punish you later. Okay, if you hold some view where you think, in the case that I gave, where the bystander has the ability to stop the, the person being essayed, and they go, you know what? I'll wait. I'll let you do it. I'll wait for you to come around the block, and then I'll punch you in the face, or I'll take you to jail. Did they do a good thing? What was the good? What would be a what would be the better thing for them to stop them right away, or would the better thing let me wait and I'll punish you afterwards? Which one's better in your view? He'll, he'll, Don't give me a big story. Tell me directly sure. which one is. Don't give me a big story. Tell me directly which one is. I anticipate you're going to do the dodgy Perfect move. Perfect justice you do will be served. Play first baseman for the and LA life Dodgers. will be granted to those who. To understand perfect so, so justice will be served perfect justice it will be served perfect justice will be for those who no, are no, wicked no, and evil no, no. and on. want so, to so, rave so the other hold on so the other ones so to answer directly the other one's better where you wait and punch that person after they essayed them that's better i'm asking about this specific example i see somebody this essaying somebody i could stop them no 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 for fuck's sake listen to me. <laughs> yeah. do not this is why i'm anticipating this i'm, I'm I'll God, answer it right now. I know the. I know. You know I already I'm, know no, the answer. I'm, I'm mute. Yeah, I'm muting you right now. You're gonna fucking listen, right? So, I asked you in this scenario where I come up to somebody and I see somebody uh, essaying somebody, and I go, you know what? I have the ability to stop. It's in my power. I can stop this. I can do it easily, like that. Nope. I'm gonna walk down the street. I'll wait for them to do it. I'll wait for them to get what they want out of it. Then I'll punish them. Right, then I'll do whatever to them. Now you tell me which one is better. The first one, we'll, we'll label it. One is for the one where I intervene and stop them and prevent them from doing it. Two is the one where I let them do it. So all I want from when I when you get unmuted is to tell me one is better or two is better. If you say anything else, I'm gonna fucking drop you. One. At or the two. time to stop them, to stop them. One, stop one them. or two. One being stop them is one. One stop being stop happens. them and prevent yeah, it from we, happening. That's what two, we should do. Let it happen. Okay, great. So we don't want to. Third commit. option. There's a third option. No, 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 there's not. No, it's either I prevent it or I don't prevent it in my power. That's a true dichotomy. Learn basic logic, right? It's not my problem. I'm not here to educate you or give you a lecture on basic logic. You have to go do that yourself. So I'm not going to I'm not going to do that for you. So we don't want to equivocate on a – now it's going to be harder because I don't think you're going to understand this. We don't want to equivocate, right? We don't want to have a fallacy. We don't want to commit a fallacy of equivocation, right? When I, we say that that's the better option, then it's also the better option – for any other agent, right, in that scenario. So it's better for God to do that. Now you take a contradictory view. You think it's better in the case of God to do that. So you're equivocating. God isn't good. He's shmud. You're not even using this, the right label to describe God. You've changed the subject to shmud. Not good. Option. You're, and, and by oh. the way, I want, I, in the comments for anybody, nice to have a contradiction counter on this call. <laughs> Can I say the third option, please? Will you allow me to? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and give me the, th yeah, so the third option. The third option. Prevent, preventing this it or the not third preventing option. it. Yeah, give the, the third option. Who did the, the yeah, go ahead. Here's the third. The person who did the wrong asks and repents and asks for forgiveness and want, and seriously is so sorry that they That's did it and they'll the never do it again. Horn. They That's are so, on the second and, horn. and then they're forgiven. They're That's forgiven. You, just, you affirm this. That's the listen, third option. You just affirm. Listen, oh, wow. you just affirmed the second horn. You just said uh, they're not going to prevent it, and then they're going to go off and like talk to some imaginary dude in the room about it. That's what you told you, me. I just care about the extra little shit that you added to it. It's also crazy that you just like kick the can down the road here, where you say, "Well, they could just repent later no, on." That's what wow. happens. So, with so, us. That's so here's true. the question, James. It's when when the person repents, when the person repents and asks for forgiveness, does that unrape the person that they that they raped earlier? Are they no longer raped? No, they they suffer. So so what's better? Which is the better, more moral situation? That somebody rapes somebody and goes sawi, or that somebody just doesn't rape somebody in the first place? What which is the better option here? 
it's it, it's better for no one to get raped. But here, here's the question. So though. then it would be better for God so to intervene about, and stop it, right? Yes, it would. If God yes, wants it would. to, it, yes, it would. So if so, God does, God know your heart and your intentions, James. Does God know your heart and your intentions? Yes. He just said, he did actually, question, okay, so then if someone what no, about, you don't get to ask the questions. This is our fucking ask, show. If you no, question. I will not. No, but I, I will want. not. I don't give a shit what you want. If God sees somebody about to rape somebody and knows their heart and their intentions, he could still intervene and stop it and still have a reason to punish them. Jesus said, if you look at a person with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart and you're just as bad as if you actually went out and had an affair. So God could say, if you decide to rape somebody and start trying to do it, I can stop you right now. This person is now safe. They didn't get hurt. And also I punish you. He could do both, but instead he elected to create a world where rape and murder, and slavery, and starvation, and cancer, and all the other shit that you're prescribing to sin still happens. He could decide to make a world where nobody ever suffers, and everybody is judged evenly and fairly, and he chose not to. He brought suffering into the world on purpose. No matter how you slice it, the blame falls on God. And we're right back where we were 20 fucking minutes ago before you said 13 contradictory things. Do you get away with all your stuff? Why should you get away with all the things you've done? Why? No, but if this is perfect what? justice, no Why? one would get, get away, away with, with anything. That that nobody knows about. Why should you not not be punished for your wrongs, your immorality? Why not? Why are you are you above being punished? So no, are you just going to completely ignore the point no, and move no. on to something else, or do you want to actually try to address what we just that said? Is my point: God's being patient with you and everyone else. Oh, That's how funny. fucking cute. You should hey, be, be sure next time you meet somebody who's lost a child or somebody who's been raped or someone who's been a sufferer of, you know, had a family member go through suicide, just let them know to be patient because God's being patient. That sounds awfully fucking charming. Fuck your God. He's, an, he's a monster. He's completely evil no matter how you slice it. And I'm really, really sick of 30 fucking minutes of you making excuses for evil. You wouldn't put up with it from yourself. You wouldn't put up with it from me. You wouldn't put up with it from anybody else. You only make excuses for this God with ridiculous logical contradictions because you've been trained to, and it's gross. If you're not willing to go out into the world and tell every fucking person who's suffering that it's a good thing that they're suffering, you deserve that cancer because somebody 2,000 years ago ate a fucking apple, then you're not being honest with yourself. If you're not willing to go out and tell everybody who's suffering today that it's all part of the plan, it's a necessary part of all of this, God's just being patient and you should be patient too, then you're not being honest with yourself and you're not being honest with us. You're making excuses for an objectively evil worldview and you're tap dancing around the fact that no matter what you put on this, all the blame inevitably goes back to the person who's pulling the strings. God made this world the way he wanted to make it. He could have made any other world any other way. And he picked this one. And anybody who would run a world like this is a fucking sociopath. That's the end of it. And with that, I'll give you the last word, and then we'll wrap up the show. I like spicy food. Well, all I'm going to say is I, I, I don't believe I'm, I don't I don't look at it the way that you just explained or that you described. Secondly, everyone still has an opportunity. God is being patient with you guys, too, and me and everybody else. Fuck him and his patience. Have a great day, James. What an absolutely disgusting worldview. I'm happy that people get to see how far the term might spread the kind of brain rot that comes with this kind of thinking. If you're willing to say, yeah, well, well, yeah, he could stop the rape. He could stop the murder. He could help the starving children. He could cure cancer, but yeah, he's just patient. He's just patient. Fuck you. Yeah. Absolutely the, the disgusting. Whole, the, the whole thing with like, well, he doesn't need it. It's not necessary. Okay. So wait a second. Um, mm. I desire to like, I don't know, not get wet. And so I believe umbrellas protect me i believe that it's raining outside and i just go walk past the umbrella and stand in the rain and force mm -hmm. you 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 tell me i'm being irrational right <laughs> it's your fucking fault I'm inevitably being exactly. irrational, yes. right yeah yeah it's just it's a very strange thing when you go there and you go look god has all these 
um, he could create these worlds, but he has prevailing reasons for this world with the evil. And then it turns out, well, it's not actually necessary. Okay, so then he's just irrationally adding this thing. Like, isn't it all good being an all rational being? Yeah. I mean, anyway, it's, it's, it's just- nonsense. Uh, with that, that's the end of our show. Uh, really quickly, before we let you go, I got to let you know that we've got the Brick Fundraiser that you can still participate in. Uh, you can leave a lasting impression on the Atheist Community of Austin by participating in this fundraiser. You get a custom engraved brick. Go to tiny.cc slash ACA Bricks for more information. Um, you can also contact us if you're curious about the show, you want to learn more, you want to get in contact with one of the hosts. You can uh, go to atheist-community.org. Uh, you can also write to us at tv at atheist-community.org. Uh, we get emails all the time for different people. Uh, I've got an inbox that I get things sent to. I have never yet responded to a single email <laughs> because I don't check it very often. I'm sorry, but you can send it. Um, I, I got this one a little while ago. It was uh, this, this person wrote in uh, to, to point out that in one video, in one episode, I compared God to the devil. Uh, and, and But I should know that Mark 3.29 says that blasphemy is, is something that's unforgivable and that mm-hmm. my soul is in peril and that I should repent. Uh, why the fuck would you think that I hadn't thought about do you think that's new information do you think i'm gonna be like oh shit i mark mark said it into g just also by the way i think jesus ever farted do you think jesus ever farted he he, it talks about him eating and drinking you think he ever farted and what and do you think think that is honestly do you think they were crazy do you think his farts had magic powers because his spit does he healed a blind man with spit you think his fart had magic powers you could turn him into like uh the smell of I don't know, yeah. lasagna or something. Yeah, it's just far smell. A lot of your metaphors have been around food. I'm, I'm guessing you're you're wanting some dinner, wanting to get out of here. I right? am. I am. I, I I am. I am actually yeah. very hungry. So anyway, yeah. no, none of that's blasphemous. Guy who wrote in, none of that. Those are just yes or no questions. If he was a man, then then and he ate and drank. Surely, surely he pooed and 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 passed gas. I'm just curious. Do you, do you think? Do you think maybe his farts had magic powers? That's what I want to know. Write me an email about it. Or don't. I'm not going to check anyway. <laughs> and with that, that's our show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for, for being a part of this community. Uh, thank you to our call screeners. Thank you to our mods. Thank you to the crew. Thank you to uh, Armin, who's been our backup and hanging out over here. Uh, thank you so much to Mike for hanging out with me and being my co-host today. Uh, if you're watching the show, thank you so much, no matter who you are. Uh, please call in next time if you're a theist and you want to try to convince us, because we're going on, what is this now, 27 seasons? We've yeah. yet to be convinced. Have an awesome rest of your day and never stop learning. Bye-bye. Bye. Shout out to Armin. Bye. Watch Talk Heathen Live Sundays at 1 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash YTTH and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call TH.